Hey, Barry. Morning. How are you? Hey, I'm going to make you co-host. I got to go uh, take a bio break. I just woke up. Okay. I will let people in. <clears throat> And it's one minute after. All right. Uh, is there but only one topic for today? Um, did, did we reserve a topic for today? I don't remember. I think the world has reserved a topic for us today. Oh, you mean about Ukraine? Yeah, that's really depressing. Actually, I'm curious. One of the questions I was going to ask is whether anyone knows the history of that Ukraine Russia tension. My understanding is it's not a simple issue. It's a very complicated. I mean, all of Europe, you know, goes back hundreds of years of complicated political history and changing borders and changing government models and who, you know, what ethnic group is associated with what piece of geography. It's a myth. Okay, here's Stacy. I'll click the admit button for her. One of my uh, sets of grandparents came to the U.S. from Kiev, I think maybe 140 years ago. They got out of Eastern Europe while the getting was good and never looked back. Maybe so you're over. part or whole Ukrainian? Well, technically that would make me one quarter Ukrainian because one set of grandparent, great grandparents. But... Um, that was all part of the Jewish diaspora. So, you know, they, I mean, the people who went to Eastern Europe and Europe during the diaspora were not really, you know, native to those territories. I understand. They were never, I understand. Really, never really identified with the uh, indigenous populations. Yeah. For example, they spoke Yiddish, not Ukrainian. And they, they brought over, you know, their Jewish recipes, blintzies and borscht and whatever, but they didn't bring over any Ukrainian culture. I just woke up, so I don't know much. All I know is there seems to have been some fighting in Kiev. Yeah. It looks like the initial attempt has been rebuffed, but I doubt that Putin's going to stand still for that. No. It's going to be bloody and awful, and it's going to have repercussions that last for a couple of, couple of generations, I think. 
Yeah. I don't know if either one of you noticed, but there was a woman on my Facebook page. I know her personally. She's from Russia. Um, I know her. She her husband was actually my vice president when I was the president of the condo in Florida. And she's really been drenched in Russian propaganda. Did you see that? I didn't know how to respond to her. No. She actually she actually thinks Putin is the hero trying to help the Ukrainian people. And it was, you know, I really tiptoed not, you know, I didn't go into facts because it's not about facts. I know facts isn't going to change anything. It was just, it, it, it just brought to light a lot of stuff concerning propaganda though. And for the first time, it made sense to me why Trump would praise Putin. Well, and that has- Authoritarians think alike, Miss Kayla. Yeah, they admire each other. Right. Well, more than that, though, I'm thinking it, it, it's very important to keep, you know, it's very important to keep that dialogue. Like he, like he really has a need to keep the dialogue to be to make this about the United States. Not that, not that. You know, <laughs> there there isn't a role there historically, but that but that's not his goal. Well, America's an imperialist country too. Right, exactly. Of course. So, you know. Well, and that's why when I when I first dealt with her, I said I'm you know, I'm not disagreeing about the propaganda in the US. I'm not, you know, I I you know, there were certain things that you're right. And how come we weren't paying attention eight years ago? Can't okay. argue with it that you're there. So let me ask a GCC question. Sure. If we were successful in 2017 until now, what position would we be in to influence the conflict? What might we have achieved? What might we actually enact? We might have given Ukraine a better ability to defend itself against- no, I'm talking about GCC. I'm talking about GCC. Oh. What well, could we have done? in the four or five years of conversation that would have made a difference? Oh. If anything. I think maybe he had a more, more concrete agenda, more concrete set of goals, objectives that we are here for a pre-explained reason other than something very vague and meta and general. Yeah, I'd like for this not to be treated as a flip question. I don't think it's actually a quick answer. I think there's actually much that is possible that we could have explored and can still explore. And hopefully these kind of conflicts help us refocus what we're doing here in GCC. GCC was originally in response to a request for a different global governance model. Yeah, and then I would have, I would have contributed a lot to the theory Exactly. Of governance models, but that's so a bloody abstract. Forget um, the abstraction. If we could actually make any progress. Now, I know that you're one of the people who actually mentions that we don't make much progress, Barry, but had we made progress, could we have still made a step towards a better outcome, a better path through all of this? For GCC or for the world? I'm talking about GCC's history and how it might have, in a fictional other universe, have made a larger, hopefully better impact on yeah, the world. I, I, and I'm I, actually I, not looking for an answer. I'm actually oh, not looking for an answer. Then I won't answer. <laughs> I'm actually looking for a meditation on this and then some discussion. Because I think the quick answers are too easy. Well, it's easy to say and difficult to implement. It's not it's even like easy saying, to say. The easiest like things saying, to say are the ones that you've been thinking all along. I mean, it's like saying we should all be smarter and wiser. Yes, <laughs> that's easy to say and very hard to achieve <laughs> to be smarter and wiser. Well, well I have well, something. I, I'm yeah, sorry. Casey? I have something. To, I have something to say about the question. You keep saying if we were successful, but I keep saying I don't know what the goal was, and a lot of people are saying what was the goal. Right. The goal was to find some focus. So my understanding of the goal was for me to meet other people who were like-minded 
so that I could collaborate with them. For example, Heiner. Stacy hey, wanted me to meet Heiner. Stacy, you actually raised a good question. Maybe we should not feel bad at all that we've not done more because there was no such agreement. I didn't say I felt bad or good. I'm just, I'm I just going bad. back to the way I we I feel somewhat it. bad. Oh, I don't feel, I don't feel bad about my participation here. I don't either. Anyway. I don't feel bad about my participation here. I'm just saying that there's some opportunity that's represented here that we have not yet manifested, that we have not yet realized. Yes. Who was it that said, everyone is guilty of the good they didn't do? Who said Say that again, you're a little muddied. Everyone is guilty of the good they did not do. Oh, yeah. Who said that? I don't recall. Was it Voltaire? It could have been one of those European philosophers, maybe. I don't know. Sins of omission. You're talking about sins of omission versus sins of commission. It is the omission done, part. I don't want to call it a sin. But well, just yeah. a, a shortfall, <laughs> a, a, a missing the mark. Yes. Uh, not not taking what somebody one of the uh, uh, basketball players says you miss every shot you don't take that's right it's sort of so if you don't take a shot then you can't complain about the fact that you didn't you didn't make the shot yeah well that's a little too abstract for me <laughs> I'd, ra I'd rather focus on the phrase when you know better you do better yes Maya. yeah angela my uh, my angela her name right my angela yeah, yeah. So what is the latest? I haven't caught up on all the news. Um, is Putin sending more troops? I don't know about the numbers. Mm -hmm. It's just that we get little stories of Kermishes and people re reacting to it. There was a missile that hit a high rise residential tower, a little bit like hitting the World Trade Center, except it's not nowhere near as big and it was yeah. residential. But hey, uh, can I, for interest of openness and curiosity. Can I read a two paragraph posting by a Turkish friend of mine? I don't actually know her, but her name is Amina Dilek. And she posted this uh, what uh, two days ago, February 24th at 6.25 AM. I'll link to it later. And here it is verbatim. My last comment about Ukraine. Firstly, if you and the degenerate Western corporate media were so worried about innocent civilians, why were they not freaking out like right now when the Obama administration ran out of bombs in 2016, bombing over seven countries who have done nothing to us, indiscriminately murdering civilians, many children, why? So the civilians we killed don't count? Secondly, if you don't even know the name and nationality of the so-called journalist who started the revolution in 2014 and who funded it to literally topple the Ukraine's legitimately elected president because the dude was refusing to join NATO and the EU, you can properly shut up about Ukraine. You don't know shit, exclamation point. If you don't know the neo-Nazis we installed as the Ukraine government have been shelling and bombing Russians with the weapons we supply for the past eight years, you can properly shut up about Ukraine. Also, if you don't know history and the fact that NATO was not supposed to expand, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, that first paragraph to me said, there's a lot that I do not know about this history. And I'm not taking sides, okay? I'm just saying there's a lot that is just not learned. And I, I would lean into that and try and figure out what's really going on. That doesn't justify war. Nothing is ever that clear and clean cut. However, there seems to be a lot that's in the complexity of that situation that I'm still learning. Okay, so I'm still trying to figure out what's really going on here. I'm not trying to say Putin is at all justified in what he's doing, not at all. I'm just saying that the situation is complex and I don't know it. I think there was a lot in the first part of what she said that I could definitely agree with. Um, there was a little bit that towards the end that I, it was a little bit too emotional for me to even entertain. But I wanna say, and I think I posted it in GCC, there was a really interesting interview with Noam Chomsky and he very simply explains the NATO piece, you know, and that was helpful to me because I did not know, you know, there's still a lot I don't know, but I am doing my due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, there's that uh, picture of the Russian soldier crying on the streets of Kiev. 
I don't know if you guys no. saw that one. What I do know for sure, and I believe this from trusted sources, is that there is a lot of uh, viral misinformation that we should expect to be coming our way and we should look yes. out for it. If we're not sure, we can't verify, don't spread it. It's the old political uh, rule number N, where N is a very small number, you know? Let, never let a go, good crisis go wasted, or some right. words to that effect. The other thing is it does seem very legitimate that there is a lot of um, Russian resistance to this. The people coming out, I think there were almost 2,000 people that have been arrested in Russia for protesting the war. So I'd like to, you know, highlight that because that's, you know, I think it's, I think it's important that we separate the Russian people from Putin the same way I want to be separated from Trump. Right. Right. <laughs> hey, um, since I read that excerpt from Emine, there's a much longer email I got from a friend of mine who is Russian, Pavel Luksha. I don't know how many of you know him. I have met him on several occasions. He's the leader of something called Global Education Futures. A very good friend of mine, Alexander Laszlo, works very closely with him. So may I give you some paragraphs of what he has written me? And to his would, you be, would you also be willing to copy some of that in the chat? Yeah, I'll do that after I read it, if that's OK. OK? okay. And then stop me or make boring uh, movements if it's, if it's uh, too much for you guys, OK? Well, maybe so, put the transcript on for Barry. <laughs> I will do that. I will do that after I read it, OK? Okay, so Pavel wrote this on the 24th also, okay? Very important day. My dear international friends, as someone who for years tried to represent the peaceful and constructive image of Russia in the world, I feel devastated and ashamed by the military aggression of my country in Ukraine. Years of my own efforts and thousands of local civic leaders who conducted meaningful and good things are getting nullified in a single decision taken by a bunch of autocrats. What led to the aggression, the cases of Donbass and Crimea, the geopolitical consideration of NATO Russia were controversial. It is not a black or white, but a messy situation, yet there is nothing there to justify a full-scale war that the Russian government has become. I feel very strongly that I have not spoken strongly enough in the past on previous cases of Russian imperialism and the suppression of civil freedoms inside my country. I thought like many people around me that this current regime could be reasoned with that we could create a positive impact below the radar, and we did. But I have to admit it only strengthened the current regime. I unfortunately chose to close my eyes to many injustices I saw for the sake of the greater good, and I am deeply sorry for that. I wanna go back down a, a couple of this and uh, going down to the bottom here. The last of my work has been dedicated to exploring possible positive scenarios for the long-term futures of mankind. What we are going through in the bigger picture is in the worlds of my friend Alexander Laszlo, that we all become the mother giving birth, the baby being born, and the midwife supporting the birth of a new civilization. The process of the birth is heavy. It is dangerous accomplishment. Grouse perinatal matrix model speaks of the second and third matrices or the stages that include intoxication to provoke the baby into movement and the struggle that helps the baby go into the world. The new world is being born, but it will happen through the intoxication and the repulsion of the current world and the struggle to get out. There will be shock and pain. Anyway, that's two of the five or six paragraphs that he, um, that he sent. By the way, I think there is a GCC email list. So I'm gonna send this to email list also. But I'll include both Emine and uh, Pavel's uh, thoughts here in the chat today. The what Pavel sent you was that private though? No, he sent that to many international friends. Good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, it's too big for me to paste into the uh, chat. Well, if you're going to email it, that's fine. I'll do that. Ah, certain people and their limitations. Uh, yeah, yeah. Certain apps and their limitations. Can anyway. I ask you what you're emailing under GCC or is it just under Sam or is it for the whole I don't group know. I'll have to figure out, you know, when I get to my email, I'll do it, but uh, probably under my name. Okay. Or just said, so you I just think... took over the GCC. I don't understand what's going on here. I don't know. What, what are you doing. saying, Josh? What am I, what did I do? Uh, you said, I'm going to send this out to the GCC. Boom, boom, I said boom, GCC boom, boom, boom. mailing list. 
Right, the GCC mailing list. Is it Sam's mailing list or is it the GCC's mailing list? Josh, what are you so triggered about? The, why are you talking with these emotions? Remember you said the other day- Look, Who's speaking with emotions, really Josh? Emotional. You who's both are. With emotions, Josh? You both are. Started, so, I'm just trying to figure out what Josh is accusing me of. You yelled at me, you went, what are you talking about, Josh? And I was like, oh I'm my curious. God, Sam, calm what down. are you talking about, Josh? I'm talking about, okay. you said that the GCC's mailing list. Yes. So I asked the clarifying question, is the Sam's mailing list or is it the GCC's list? Uh, it's probably the mailing list I created, yes. Okay, so please call it Sam's mailing list, not the GCC's mailing list, thank you. I can call it whatever I want. It's to the GCC <laughs> people. I'll talk in a second. I don't want to get you riled up. I love you, Sam. I don't think you do. If I didn't, I would keep digging in and triggering. And I, we've been here, and I'm and not. You have. Here. And I'm not. That's why I'm saying I love you because I'm not going to do that. Going back to world history lessons. Well, Stacy wants to say something also. That's okay. Go ahead, Barry. Oh, this is very quick. Um, World history was a subject that I didn't either didn't get much coverage of at all or didn't attend to or, or acquire any insight into. And not so long ago, maybe a decade or so ago, I finally understood why I wasn't getting anything out of these history lessons. And I wrote it up this way. There is a convincing narrative for every conceivable opinion or belief and a convicting narrative for every skeptic critic or infidel. I conclude that the method of comparative narratives supplemented by the method of demonization is not a reliable method for arriving at the ground truth. It's good for rallying people up though. Absolutely. You can have <laughs> narratives on opposite sides and each one by itself sounds very convincing. That's right. Right. Propaganda. It's great for making people feel justified. And if you get both sides of it, you don't know how to resolve it because they're mutually inconsistent narratives and you have no underlying theory that's a scientifically testable theory to resolve which, which interpretation is, is uh, well-grounded. So you get nothing out of it. So in, answer, so in answer to Sam's original question, how might we have been in a better place? I think that we would have been able to have a process where as certain agreed upon things were in one, whatever you'd call it, a track, a cord. I don't know what the word is. And then the other things were still outliers, but at least we could travel down that main track together. Ultimately, it comes down to not of uh, humankind not having constructed a mutually agreeable governance mechanism. There are competing governance mechanisms, at least three basic categories of them, and none of them are functional and they're all mutually in competition with each other. We keep cycling through dysfunctional governance me mechanisms, theologies, aristocracies, democracies, oligarchies. We keep switching from among these different governance models, none of which are high functioning. Well, isn't it, for me at least, a misexpectation, an over-expectation to expect that any of them is high functioning? What I'd prefer to see and what I think should be uh, more possible is an evolutionary approach where we learn and adjust and yep. we improve, yep. right? And that's yep. what the amendment process is here in the US. So I think this, to expect that anything starts great, okay? Is, uh, is going to lead to disappointment. Now, the amendment process isn't perfect either. You know, that supermajority really stops things up. But at least it's a recognition that change must be accommodated. We probably have to change the amendment process. We have to change the filibuster process. Well, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but if we can't talk to each other when we disagree on things and find a way to keep moving along in a conversation, how are we collectively expected to do that? 
I so I think you, both of those things have to be worked on at the same time and they're of equal importance. Yep. And by the way, let me also go on record as saying, you've been, I think, uh, very positive in your interaction on OGM. I've been following that. Thank you. With somebody I there. That. I think you know who I, I mean. That. I do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I try. I keep forgetting the expansion of OGM. Open, Open. Global Mind. Open Global Mind. Somehow or other, I'm going to eventually remember what it stands for. <laughs> Agam. Agam's razor. <laughs> it was not a razor. <laughs> awesome had <laughs> <not> a razor. <laughs> Welcome, uh, Colin. Welcome, Kayla. You guys have been silent. I always have notes, but I figured this week was probably going to be about Ukraine. The whole thing is very depressing. But, you know, somebody put up a quote from Benjamin Franklin that says that a lot of people uh, die at age 25, but don't get buried until age 75. That is about age 25, you realize the world is a mess and you you sleepwalk through the world without being able to figure out what the hell to do about it. And then eventually you really do die, but you stop living and you just survive for half a century. And ultimately it comes down to melancholy and depression, which is a very commonplace affliction, which is generally not diagnosed and not treated. I think that Depression has is, is been identified as the single most commonplace affliction in the population, but it's not off, often not diagnosed, not treated. You just have it. It's just a lifelong experience of suffering and disillusionment and disappointment and cynicism and bitterness. And occasionally people get angry and they yell at each other or throw rocks. Most of the time they just go around sort of being sad, heartbroken. Well, our culture is not designed for wellness. No. Somebody said, if you're not depressed, you're not paying attention. And ignorance is bliss is sort of the other way around. And if you're really paying attention to what's going on, you just can't be happy. You can't, you can't be content. So you have this, you have this, this 50 year winter of our discontent and never, never really goes away. There is a dissenting view to that. Deceptive what? A dissenting view. Oh, sure. Absolutely. In fact, it goes back to Buddha. Yeah. Suffering. Buddha was quoted as saying, once you understand how the world works, you'll throw your head back and laugh. A laugh, yeah, because it's better than crying. But, you know, Emmett Kelly. I don't take, yeah, I didn't take that interpretation either. Yeah. I took it as, he, you will realize what it was really all about. Yeah. yeah, it's a cosmic joke. Not that it's a joke, that it's a learning. It's a learning yeah. about opposing energies. Shakespeare wrote only two, two styles of plays, comedies and tragedies. And a lot of stories are told as tragedies the first one or two times around and then eventually become comedies because you end up laughing at how idiotic they are. I don't mean to make this a ping pong, but <laughs> that's the way things have always been. That yeah. does not mean that's the way things have to go going forward. And I think there's a real movement behind making that shift. Right. I don't disagree. I mean, literary works always have a last chapter. Yeah. Life doesn't. A lot of comedies are stories that originally began as tragedies. Just they end up making fun of them. And that's one way that you can educate the public. If you, if, you, if you show how silly our idiocy is, our tragic idiocy is, maybe a few people will discontinue those idiotic practices in the next two or three generations. But it takes two or three generations. I don't, I don't think that's true. I mean, let's look at all in the family. Okay, so maybe it made the impact it was meant to at the time, but if somebody were to watch that now, they would think, hey, it's nothing wrong with being this way. So I don't know that I agree with that whole. Yeah. It was very controversial when that show first aired. 
Oh, Meathead did all right. Who did all right? Meathead. Meathead. Rob Reiner. Oh, yeah. uh, I think what's more important is what Barry brings up all the time about becoming. Because I think the more we show up as ourselves instead of splitting ourselves off into who we go to work as or who we show up in public as and what we're really feeling inside, which that split, I think, leads to a lot of the depression. If we can really embody who we are inside and be able to show up that way and be able to stay balanced in that way, I think that's I think that's the purpose, actually. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Let me ask a, uh, uh, um, a thought experiment. What's the right word for thought experiment? If you imagine the other species, whether it's monkeys or squirrels or mice or lions or you know giraffes or whatever, are they happy? Are they mentally healthy or are they depressed? And can we characterize them in those ways? Yeah, I think so. I think you can tell dogs, especially, I think you can dogs tell when they're happy and when they're uh, disappointed or whatever, you know, negative valence emotion you want to name. I think you can tell when dogs are down and when they're up. So my question is pointed at those who are still in a position who need to fight for their survival every day. Right. Is that a state of depression or is that a state of happiness or is that a state of mental health? It's a state of drudgery. You know, one day at a time. We just, you know, muddle along one day at a time. We're not thrilled. We're not, we're not suicidal, but we're not thrilled. We're right. just barely eking it out. Well, that's what drugs and TV and shopping is for. <laughs> and that's why I'm asking, you know, are there species who are still in drudgery daily, fighting for their survival, like fearful that they're going to get eaten by the next predator? Are they depressed? I mean, they're clearly in fear. I don't think you have time to be depressed when you're in survival mode. It's a kind of a melancholy, but it's a, it's just below the surface melancholy. You go around moaning and groaning in public, but you know you keep it to yourself. But there's this <clears throat> persistent melancholy. Um, you know, you're you're not thriving. You're you're not dying, but you're not thriving either. You're in this sort of gray area in the middle where. You know, you can find the next meal and, you know, get the next night's sleep and get the next paycheck, but, you know, ho-hum. So I know Josh has his hand up, but let me say one more thing before turning over to Josh. And that is, the reason I'm asking these questions is directed towards if an animal knows that they've got the skills that can ensure their own survival on a day-to-day -day basis, what do you call that? Do you call that happiness or do you call that mental health? Or do you call that confidence? Because I think there's some inter overlay among those concepts. So I'm saying if there's a evolution of species and a everlasting difficulty in survival until humans, you know, recently, then what can we say about the evolution of mental state throughout all this time? And the fact that we can recognize some of these mental states comes when some of us now have an excess of quote unquote leisure time, that we're no longer every one of us fighting for our survival in doubt that it will actually be you know, possible to live till tomorrow. So I'm just raising these questions because you know, to me, if I look at it in those terms, depression, fear for self, fear for life, that's just natural. Historically, over. And I know Josh has got something to say. It was earlier when you were asking the question about survival mode, I was just going to ask if anyone here was recently in survival mode and can remember that themselves, or if they have a very close friend that is currently in survival mode that has talked to them and shared what it feels like. Instead of asking these questions, if there's an actual example of someone either yourself or close to you that has that. I know people who are struggling basically with, with diseases of aging or 
pandemic issues and things like that, or struggling, you know, with children not being able to go to school and, you know, just sort of barely, they're, they're not thriving. They're not dying, but they're not thriving. And more, more discontent than contentment. I mean, just, just slightly positive contentment would be good enough. It would suffice us. But when it falls below the sort of the median level of contentment, you get into discontent, low grade, but persistent discontent, melancholy. You're not thriving. Interestingly enough, I know a couple of people that were really in survival mode and what actually helped two of them was COVID relief. The money. Yeah. Yeah. Because you could buy groceries. I go to the grocery store, I have enough money to buy groceries, but the shelves are empty. I have to buy stuff that I don't really like or want because it's all that's left. <clears throat> and out of the countries, that's been the norm for decades. Yeah, shortages. I mean, look at the supply chain shortages. This is a, nobody's thrilled about supply chain shortages. Everybody's unhappy about it. We struggle along, we do without, you know. So question. Push your buttons, really. Has Europe actually frozen uh, Russia out of the SWIFT banking system yet? No, they, they don't want to do that because um, they depend on Russian sources for um, fuel supplies and other things. And if you can't pay them, then you can't buy the stuff that you need for your just your infrastructure. There's too much dependence on your infrastructure. <laughs> then what does sanctions mean? The last I heard was that it was Hungary that was the one that was creating the whole- now agreed. What? what was the now agreed. Oh, they have? Okay. Yeah. They haven't done anything this morning. I haven't looked into anything. No, there's, they're not going to do SWIFT probably for the foreseeable future unless they can line up sources for what they need for you know daily <laughs> survival and not need not needed to buy it from Russia because if you have to buy it from Russia, you got to pay them. If you can't pay them, then you can't buy it. Did you see the comment from from Kayla? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let me just. Pornhub has put up a Ukrainian flag for all members who are trying to access Pornhub from Russia. Well, that's where the, that's where it all starts. Actually, the whole internet started off with porn. So uh, that's. The other big thing that was on the news is what about the International Space Station? And Russia has a big part in that. And like you start to, it's like the parents got divorced. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, what's going to happen with this? This is a big deal. This is really going to affect millions and millions. And this is no laughing matter. This is some fucked up shit. MIT, millions of people. MIT, we talked about this. MIT cut ties with their partner in Russia. There was a, a research program that involved a matching institution in Russia, MIT just shut it down. They're not going to do business with their partners in Russia because of the Ukraine thing. Yep. And uh, that's a lot of frustrated young boys that want to go to war if they can't jerk off watching porn. I'm just <laughs> being honest. I'm being straight up. It's By the way, did anybody confirm that that Pornhub story is true and not just a joke? No. Easy enough for them to do. I read, I read it to be a joke because... I wasn't, but I wasn't going to look it up to see if it was if Snopes had looked into it. <laughs> I don't have a Russian handle on any of these porn sites. Where's Alona? She was here. She was the one that brought me to GCC, the Russian lady that brought me here to GCC. Where's where's her take on this? Uh, being a person that lived in Russia for a long was still in Russia when she was here on the GCC. It'd be interesting to hear her take. I'd love if you do have an email list. I hope she's on it. And if not, I'll give you the email, Sam. I would, I'm taking it very seriously, like the Global Challenge collaboration, because what you said really hit me hard, Sam. I've been up since four in the morning. I think I got two hours sleep. I'm in a 24 hour, um, like, I think it's like a citizen journalist room where they're grabbing propaganda or different pieces of things and going, okay, you speak Russian. Translate it for us. Are we getting the right translation? Is this real propaganda? Is this real? And everyone's just constantly coming in and out of the room. Uh, people from Kiev, people from Ukraine, 
you know, people on the ground. And it's just like, everyone's just trying to make sense of what's going on because it's so hard to get good information these days. It's really difficult. I, mean, huh. I rely on you guys as a think tank. And when you said, Sam, you know, what has GCC done? We never formalized as a think tank, but we could probably get some lobbyist money and have some people try to push us in one certain agenda. And we could push back, but we could be a legit think tank, which is what I think Lauren um, from the Practical Knowledge Ecology was trying to do, that she told me straight out she wanted to work for DARPA and build a think tank. And she was trying to, you know, grab your barn raising, Sam, and propagate another group off of that and i'm just saying you know we can take this very serious in terms of we've talked about global governance for i guess you said now almost five years it's 2017 it's getting on a five-year anniversary this november so I, I would take it serious i think there's a lot of people that have come in and out of gcc that are really smart people klaus manger he's been i mean there's some barry stacy kayla you sam i mean these, you guys are smart people you're global thinkers, not just systems thinkers, but spiritual, emotional thinkers. Like you asked me, Sam, last week, what is sacred geometry? I want to lean in. And I took that very sincere and serious. Like these are sincere things that we're tackling here. And I think it's important for us to be united as a group to think together, especially in times when the world is so tumultuous, which you know, we haven't had this kind of war the United States government has imposed seven different wars in the last 15 years, but there were wars that didn't affect our pocketbooks. And this war is going to affect the definitely the fuel and the gas prices here in America and the supply chains. And as we speak, there's a giant U.S. convoy coming from California to Washington, D.C. of truckers. So things are heating up on many angles and many fronts, and it's only going to get more tumultuous before it settles. And I think we need to be united if, if we're gonna keep meeting on Saturdays and at least raise a conversation. So that's my piece and thank you for letting me share what's on my heart and mind. I can give you an example of sacred geometry. Have you ever heard of physicists say that the electron has a quantum uh, number called spin one half? Like what the hell is spin one half? That sounds like a really weird thing. Here's a tube, I don't know if you can see this. And I, I, if you rotate it, I have a line that goes down and after one complete rotation, it's at the bottom. And the second complete rotation, it's right back to where it started. So one rotation without it going up and down will just go around this way. But because I have this line going around down to the bottom and then back up again, it takes two rotations to get it completely back up to closing. And that is an example of spin one half. And if you ask yourself, what does that got to do with physics? They think that electron has a magnetic moment that, has a, that points some direction in space, like a top. But it doesn't, it precesses. But it doesn't precess the simple way like a top, it precesses this oddball way. So as it precesses, it also nutates. It goes down and then back up again. So twice around precession is once around the up down. That is sacred geometry because without it, I would fall through my chair. That's geometry. What makes it sacred? It's because it makes the world, makes, makes reality real. It, but it, all of geometry can be discussed that way. Oh, it, it's, it's astonishing. This is so hard to understand. This concept is a spin one half is so mind boggling that it's almost impossible to explain it to anybody. And yet I can draw an example of it and it's not that hard to see this example, but it's hard to imagine something having this kind of a, this is called the Dirac belt trick. <laughs> that you can go around twice and come back to where you started, but around once you're, you're, you go from right side up to upside down to right side up again in two rotations. That is not, you know, you wouldn't imagine that. And when you see it, it's, it's visually mind boggling until you, you know, play with it for a week. And yet that's what electrons do. And that's why I'll spin one half, spin three half would be three times around to one time up. 
So you have these complicated um, ge geometric notations which make the world behave the way it behaves, makes, makes matter behave the way it behaves. For example, I don't fall through my chair. That's pretty astonishing. And yet I, I would defy you to find one person in a thousand who understands that. So I agree with your last claim, but uh, Josh has a uh, yeah, go ahead, Josh. hand up. No, hey, I'm, I'm just really glad Barry's explaining it that way. And the reason why I'm very happy is before I found sacred geometry, I was in a conundrum that I couldn't answer the question of why Niels Bohr put the yin yang sign on his coat of arms when he was knighted by the Queen of England. And it was driving me mad, literally insane. I kept drawing the yin yang sign on a whiteboard over and over again, trying to figure out the significance of the yin yang sign. And then I finally realized through understanding sacred geometry that it wasn't a flat 2D yin yang sign, just like the Star of David is not a flat two pyramids on top of each other in 2D, it's a three-dimensional object. So right. when you look at the yin-yang as a three-dimensional of negative space and positive space spinning on itself, it's exactly what Barry just described. It's the, the yin-yang sign is an actual representation in 2D as we usually see it, because we don't see it on a basketball. That yin-yang sign is a representation of an atom that has been around for as long as I know culture or civilization. It's one of the oldest symbols that goes back to ancient China. So it, it really blew my mind that these type of things were known. And then I found this um, flower of life, which is, it starts with eight circles, but this symbol that goes out to all the way to 64 and beyond to 128 circles, which creates these patterns that are known in sacred geometry that were known by the ancients. These patterns are on all cultures there. It's on a ball at the Forbidden City in China. There's this little ball, it's there. It's also on a temple near Luxor in Egypt. I went to Luxor to look at this symbol. I haven't been to the Forbidden City, but it's in 37 other old cultures throughout the world is this pattern of the flower of life. And so there's something there that was known by ancient people. And I think that's why it's called sacred is because it weaves through so much of humanity and so much of ancient cultures. And I also believe speaking on weaving through ancient cultures, the uh, professor from the university in Israel, Dr. Yuval Harari, wrote three elegant pieces and books about this time and this war in Ukraine back in 2015 with the first book, Sapiens, Homo Deus, and 21 Problems for the 21st Century. And some of the problems we're dealing with, he wrote in 21 Problems for the 21st Century. And the fact that we're having a physical on the ground war right now, but there's this underlying zeitgeist that we all hear in the news, there's going to be a cyber war. And we all don't know exactly what that looks like, but it's this looming threat of a cold war that might have already started in cyberspace that it has. connecting. Yeah, it absolutely has. And did and, you hear about anonymous taking out one of the Russian uh, propaganda sites? I heard them I did claim not. that. Yeah. I heard them no. claim that, but I haven't seen the evidence to say it really they really did take down all the RT outlets around the world. Well, you know, it's not, I'm sure it's not the only effort they're going after. And when this whole thing started, I thought, you know, yes, we're definitely gonna see people from Vietnam, South Korea, Taiwan, US, you know, really start up a, a cyber war against whomever they feel is in the wrong, which I think most people are saying is Russia. Yeah, if, if anyone knows the computer science world, I think it's called zero day attacks. Yeah. And zero day is when, you know, software has not been upgraded because they didn't know about the problem. So it's zero day. But there's a lot of people that are buying the knowledge of a potential hack in different software systems for millions of dollars through the hacker market. And they're holding on to them. And I'm sure Russia has quite a few of these 
Josh is froze. Josh, yeah, I think he just froze. Yeah. He has video froze. His whole system froze. In fact, that goes all the way back to when the U.S. released this worm, this virus yeah. on Iran. Remember the uh, Iran centrifuges? Is that it was a really bad move because although it accomplished its objective, it was so sophisticated in how it worked that once people discovered it, it's now available for anyone else to copy. Yeah. And that just raises the sophistication of viruses, you know, another whole quantum, if you want to use that kind of thinking. Am I back or am I still? You're back. Now. You're back. Now. Okay. Well, I just did a, a hack, which is I got Starlink and I just switched from my cable internet to Starlink. And that's lucky, how I just I haven't got it. my Starlink yet. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am lucky. That's, I well, I also signed up early. But um, th th yeah, this is really serious. I think we need to talk about it because that could lead to power outages and electrical grid. And I think we need to prepare for that. That's what I'm saying. And we need to be a united front because this is just the beginning of things to come. Yeah. And I've also been looking into, um, and I would love to talk to you more about this, Barry, is uh, different systems of communication that are outside the internet, the LoRa system for SMS and setting up mesh networks, hmm. and also ham radios and different frequencies, which I think we should definitely talk about of ways of communication across cities if there were to be power outages and things to go down and to have you know a ham radio connected to a solar panel. Yep. Before the internet, that's how they handled disasters. People got on their ham radios and made connections outside of the disaster zone where there was no telephone service. No. In fact, since you bring that up, one of the things that uh, struck me when I moved here to the island is so remote that there's a whole club, there's a whole community called the uh, CPG, the Camino Preparedness Group. And they're all about, um, well, there's a number of different things, but one entire group, subgroup, is all about the uh, ham radios and transceivers and getting people certified and teaching people how to use them and making sure you got a battery or a solar panel ready to fire up uh, so that you can actually use that transceiver. Uh, there's also things about volcano awareness, you know, and tides and this sort of thing. But this is what happens when you go very, very remote and you have to like rely on your wits to survive. The yep. I know. Fundamental you, concept. you know where I lived. Oh, sorry, Barry, go ahead. The fundamental concept for the internet was pioneered in Hawaii with the Aloha system, which was this radio link across the islands that, that presaged the modern uh, packet network of the internet. But they were doing it by radio in Hawaii, you know, back before we developed the domestic version of the internet with the same idea, the same packet communication uh, concept. And not to get too esoteric, but ancient cultures had shamans, which were people that could talk to the other side and spirits and could communicate across dimensional states. I know it sounds strange, but that is an old tradition in a lot of cultures. Smoke signals. It, it, it doesn't sound mm -hmm. strange to me, but it's really scary to me because I feel like there have been a lot of bad, not a lot, I don't know how many, but there have been bad actors infiltrating these spiritual communities. Yeah, yeah, shameless, yeah. I'm very careful to look, because I am in that, I, you know, I am a person that's interested in those things. And I'm very careful to look at the people who are trying to empower and are being very clear, like if this interpretation works, it probably doesn't work, it probably wasn't meant for you, as opposed to, these people that just think that they have this special thing that nobody else has. You know, um, it's a part of our species, not something that, you know, is gifted to a couple of powerful people. Well, they'll gift it to you if you give them enough money, I suspect. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that I think that there are people just like there are people that are born with more athletic prowess. I think there are people that through their lineage, they have, they are, their muscles are more stretched to, you know, reach other, you know, go out a little bit further in terms of their intuition, 
psychic ability, whatever you want to call it. I do think anybody can develop it, but just like any other skill, some of it you come in naturally having. A lot of children have that. And then it gets it gets beat out of them. So I think a common theme here as well as, as what I saw in OGM, Stacy, is that even in OGM, as we did here, the theme eventually wound around to how do we disagree well, civilly. Yeah, Franklin said that, gentlemen, we can disagree without being disagreeable right. during, during the writing of the, uh, of the US Constitution, the Articles of, what's the Articles of Confederation, whatever they originally called it. Well, I don't know if you saw the response that I wrote there on a separate thread, not part of the initial incident, but I just talked about one of the things that we could do, especially those people that are going to be involved in governance or people that are going to have some responsibility for decision making, is that it's really important. The, the first step as an individual is to really explore the emotions that come up for you yourself when somebody disagrees with you. Because until you really get clear on what's happening there, you really, you can't progress as much as you'd hope. You know, you can pretend things don't matter, but they still show up. You, you learn that you can't trust the other guy. What's they, basically what irreconcilable differences do. I think Stacy's saying something else though. Yeah, Sorry. I am. Stacy's saying Sorry. something else. Yeah, I know that. I just pointing out that what's at stake is trust. The, the, the phenomenon of building trust gets derailed. Instead of building trust, you end up with, di with systemic distrust, which means that there's no point in an agreement because you don't trust the other guy to keep their end of the bargain. This is what happened with uh, Putin. You know, nobody trusted him to do anything you know, that, that they would <laughs> have been content with. So to Barry's point, my personal hack is to try to stay around people who do that kind of work. Because I know even when we come to a disagreement, there's gonna be a better chance of being able to work through it without too much damage. Right. And the, the criteria I look for is, is this per person ethical? Are they doing their best to stay ethical? And then I can trust them, even though they may make a, a miscalculation unintentionally because like I say, it's harder to do the calculus of ethics than the calculus of Newton. And I certainly make mistakes doing the calculus of Newton. And I know I make mistakes doing the calculus of ethics because it's a lot harder, but at least you're trying diligently, conscientiously to be ethical that I trust them and I can forgive them for a, for a mistake because they're not gonna and repeat if, it. And if work. I could share, what I look for is honesty. Because if I can see a person being honest to somebody on the outside, there's a much better chance that they're able to be honest with themselves. Right. And that's really what I care about. Right. And we identify, diagnose, and correct misconceptions because you, you don't get through life without misconceptions. They, they're abundant. And identifying and and Correcting misconceptions is a lifelong challenge and it ain't easy. Raise your hand, Joshua. Yeah, I just keep thinking of this poem that there's a line, it's um, a poem that says, I don't care if the story you're telling me is true. I wanna know if you can be true to yourself and therefore trustworthy. If you're true to like what Barry's talking about with the word ethics, it, it gets ambiguous when we try to do a group ethical agreement. Right. But if you're true to your own beliefs, even if it's not a truth that I believe in, if you believe it's true and you're acting upon that with best intentions to yourself, then I can work with that person as a group. And I think that's a really important thing is for someone to be at least honest about their truth, even if it's not something that the group agrees is true, 
and, and it's, it sounds crazy, but if, you know, if there was a flat earther here in the GCC and they truly sincerely believe the earth was flat and had experiences of seeing the flat earth, and that's really their belief system, as long as they're honest about that and they say, I believe 100% the earth is flat and everyone else in the group believes that it's round, as long as they're being true to themselves and that was their experience, they saw the edge of the earth somewhere or they had a dream or I don't know why they believe that because it's... Yeah, I, ha I have to make a distinction. Does that make sense? It, it makes sense, and I agree with okay. most of it, but I, ha I have to make a distinction between truth and honesty. So using your example, if they believe in the flat earth, that doesn't even weigh in at all to me. If they are honest about the facts that contributed to their belief, like the numbers that they're giving, the theory, that's more important. But that, and that's even separate because I'm not even talking about my truth, your truth, truth. I'm talking about just being honest about observations and being able to separate an observation from, from an opinion or an evaluation or how, whatever word you want to use. You're welcome to believe in a flat earth, but if you're going to be a navigator of the world, you're going to take the long way around you're going to go all the way around instead of going across the date line. So what's you, you're not going to you're not going to be very effective at uh, navigating the surface of the uh, Earth. You don't know you don't know what a great circle is or a straight line or shortest distance is. But again, I might so I might not trust them to do something having to do with navigation, but I can still trust them as a person. <laughs> Yeah, as that's, as, my, as that's not, my point. Not, right. As long as they're not mapping a route for you to get from A to B. <laughs> Sam? See, I even disagree with that. Because if we can actually have an honest, sincere, open conversation with a flat earther, and they give me all of the facts and all the opinions about why they believe the earth is flat, if they're open to new information, we can take them up to the top of the Empire State Building. We can take them up on a 35,000-foot airplane. We can take them up on the uh, space shuttle. They'll see the Earth. They'll see that it's round. Yeah. If they're not open to that, and they only want to hang on to their belief, then no, I do not trust that person, and I will not work for that person. But you know what, Sam? Let me just let me just take you back to the tube that Barry held up. Mm -hmm. So if he would have described that phenomenon without showing it, people would have said, no, that can't be. So Not always. That's a generalization. All right, well, what I will say is that I don't know what I don't know. So I was once given an article and it was described and I didn't go too deeply into it because frankly, I don't care. I really don't, I, I hate to say it. I don't care if the earth is flat, if the earth is round. For me personally, my world isn't, you know, and I'm talking just as an individual, but so, so it would have taken a lot of work for me to fully understand what the article was saying. However, and, and the article was, was not saying that, the, the article was not saying that the earth was flat, but what the article was doing was giving, giving a reasonable explanation why someone who is smart and does follow science could entertain that possibility. Like I said, too much work for me to go further into it. But the idea of mocking somebody right away, like I said, I've been mocked or heard people be mocked because they believe in life outside of planet Earth. To me, that's wrong. Unless you can prove to me that there isn't, which you can't. So that's all I'm speaking to. Yeah, I don't think I ever took that mocking approach towards a flat earther until they refused to ingest the new information. And at that point, I'm more in the departure mode, not necessarily in the mocking mode. If I'm feeling down, I might mock them, but mostly I'm in departure mode at that point. One, one thing, Josh, I just want to say one thing before I forget. I would prefer a style of whenever these things come up of, okay, so if that's true, how would you explain that? See if they can come up with an answer. If they can't, 
then I can let it go. But if they can, then that gives me something to think about and the ball's in my court now and I have to do some thinking. Right. Go ahead, John. Yeah, as long as they're both open, yes. Right. Yeah, and, and to, to make my point a little clearer in more practical terms, if I'm meeting with someone on a Saturday at 8 a.m. to build a barn as a community and their job is to sand the wood or their job is to pull the nails out of old wood or something that has nothing to do with whether the earth is round or not round, I'm happy and able to trust them if they say they're gonna show up at eight o'clock and they do. And if they say they're gonna do what they do, they do. I don't care what their belief system is about flat earth. I'm not launching a rocket with them or a satellite up into space. That would be a disaster if they didn't believe you know, in the same physics, but if there's some basic agreements on specific task of a specific project, and I learned this from the Occupy movement, I could work with schizophrenic homeless people and they could put the signs up. We could go around. I could do large projects with large groups of four to 800 people and everyone had different tasks that they could handle. And it, our belief system from religion was different, but we were the 99% against the 1%. And that was clear. And we were showing up to March at the same time, and that was clear. And we were doing things, you know, in a Robert's Rules of Order, which was also clear. And when the schizophrenic person went over the time in Robert's Rules of Order, they would ask me, my job was to go keep talking to that person so they don't interrupt the group and go off to the side and hear their schizophrenic rant and let them feel heard away from the group so that it didn't disrupt the Rules of Order. And I, I think it takes a group of people, not a belief system, not all agreeing on the same thing always, but working together, it, it's a real art. It's a talent. It's a skill. And it's also just sometimes someone saying, I know how to do this. I'm going to do this the right way. Who's with me? And nobody raises their hand. They don't trust or believe that person knows how to do it. But if someone says, I'm going to do this certain thing, and everyone says, hey, I believe in that person, and I'm going to go help them and we break off into subgroups, we, we got a lot accomplished in that Occupy movement by creating who's going to bottom line that thing, let that person be responsible for the success failure of that project, and letting people that wanted to help those people volunteer and help. And, and we got a lot accomplished. And I, I wish we would do more of that here at the GCC is, I want to do a newsletter. Well, I don't. <laughs> so have fun with that. I enjoy it. And all the people that want to do the newsletter, if it happens, great. But I do not have the right to say what the newsletter should be, the color of it or anything. If I opted out, then I need to sit on the side and let it succeed or fail on its merits. And I think that's a more, I don't know if that's called anarchy. I don't know what system I would ask the group what you would call that system. But as long as people aren't being that wishy-washy where as soon as the newsletter starts going, now they want to go to those committee newsletter meetings and start talking about how it should be. I think that's where governance needs to come in is if you weren't there from the beginning, you don't have the right to come in the middle and take over and power over anyone. And that's where it talks about as long as we don't power over each other, I need. I think we need those rules of governance and order and be very clear of how we, moving forward, make changes, not agreements, but changes on old agreements, if that makes sense. I'd love to find that governance system, especially here in this group. Colin's hand is up. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good, good. So, um, yeah, newsletters are cool. Um, but Stacy, earlier you said that, I found it interesting that you said that personally to you, certain world facts aren't really relevant to, your, to you or your day. Now, I'm, I'm thinking that must be within a context because I think all facts are relevant. It's just, have you delegated that responsibility to somebody else or do you yeah, trust I, somebody else? Yeah. You know what I mean? I just and mentioned then, that example. I trust you guys. You tell me the world is round. I believe you. <laughs> I'm yeah. not going to spend a lifetime going through research, right. teaching myself what I need to know to make that decision. I believe you. Well, when it comes to something a little less scientific, like should Russia invade, yeah. right? 
then there's nuance. And I'm hearing talk from both sides um, of the discussion. And um, I don't know. It's the way of the world. And I think I've been biased in being um, living in an environment that hasn't really had to deal directly with war. But, you know, I did, I did see the horrors um, from a distance. Um, and I, I don't know. It's, it's, a different, it's a different thing, but it does come down to how do we validate and how do we find a way to offer the right questions to consider? Um, and I think politics does a really good job of trying to expedite this endless semantic game that would ensue as we've experienced here ourselves, just trying to talk about what it means to agree, let alone make one, right? Imagine Putin and Sam, or Sam and Doug trying to Putin and Ukraine out an agreement. Maybe they could, or maybe, you know, I don't, I don't know, but yeah, just food for thought, like, because Barry brought up trust is what's, what's broken. And if you've lost somebody's trust, you're not even going to listen to them, even if they got the truth, you know, I, your money's no good here. You know, I'll go find out from somebody else. So it's a big problem. Um, and how do you filter through these truths? Another example, totally different frame. Once an artist that you like makes a piece of work and you really like the art, and then you find out the artist is a real douchebag. Do you still like the art? Right? So it's these kinds of things. How do we... The earth is flat or not. It matters more than we know, but we can't change it, right? Just if you're going to build a scientific system and you think it's flat, you're going to have a hard go. That's all. <laughs> well, but in that in certain case, scales. but in that case, I wouldn't allow yeah. them to be in a working group because there are certain things that are important to be aligned with in specific situations. Like to Josh's point, it doesn't matter what you believe if you're hanging signs, you can still be on the same team and you're not going to impede any progress. But if you're trying to find the best way to get to somewhere and somebody believes, you know, they want to figure out the way for time travel because they, they think that they, if I, if I spend, you know, 20 years on time travel, I'll recoup it, you know, <laughs> then, you know, it's different. Somebody says, let's get in the car and drive. And that's a really bad example, but I, I don't even know. No, I mean, I get, I get you. I'm not, I'm not criticizing you any more than just showing that humans look at things with perspectives that are not relative to what could be most valuable. Josh. I just, what you just said, Stacey, made me just, it just clicked in my head is I think the, um, I don't know if the word is value or the, uh, the depth of a group is its ability to break off away from each other and then come back together. I, I think that's a really powerful thing. And I, we used to do that on Fridays and do breakout rooms. And we haven't done that in so long, but to be able to come back together and talk about what each other discussed in a way where there's trust, that's a real powerful skill and a muscle that can be flexed and used more often than not to allow a group to get stronger where if you and I, Stacey, or Colin and Barry went into a room and we discussed a project and came back and we mm -hmm. didn't feel like they were being all right with the full group of what they discussed, it sort of shows itself right away when we all start discussing what the Braille groups discussed, if that makes sense. That's the politics of, of groupthink. It, it does make sense, but I have to say, for me personally, I have less trust in that. So what I would have more trust is two things. If there were at least three people in that conversation and if the conversation's recorded. Yes. And I think that's why we wanted to record these conversations for people that weren't on the call that could trust that they could log in to the internet somewhere and watch these recordings and know that when they came back into the group, they could hear what was discussed. Right. And I, I found that very valuable. And uh, what are you raising, Josh? The litmus test for a functioning group? I'm raising when things get into disagreement states and in states and we start discussing a subject, if there's a group 
of people that want to opt out of that and you can discuss something at the same time. It's just a more effective, efficient way to hold meetings and groups in a way that doesn't pull people's attention and awareness away from the moment because they don't feel that they're involved in that discussion at that moment in time. And that creates more trust within the group. And if That's I could just saying. add to, I just want to add one thing, Barry, to, to that whole idea of breaking off. I think it's also to break off with, with styles, like a certain style would work better together while the other style is working separately, but then they need a place to come back and gather in the middle. So I'm all for two, diff two or three different approaches, the third being the hybrid or the blending. Mm -hmm. Barry, and I know. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was going to give an example. Uh, Stacy mentioned people who believe something sincerely, but it's it's an inaccurate belief. It's an erroneous belief. I met a few people who were diehard believers in cold fusion, and they believed in it and kept promoting this concept for 10, 20, even 30 years. And it it occurred to me, I found this very perplexing. What was it that kept them? believing in cold fusion despite not making any progress. And what I finally discovered is that they didn't understand, believe in, or subscribe to the protocols of the scientific method. They systematically departed from the protocols of the scientific method without understanding it or, or respecting it. They somehow didn't get the protocols of the scientific method as, as the fundamental thing to believe in to guide how you engage in science. And I discovered that just not, at least in my case, nothing you can do about it. They simply grew up with some departure from adherence to the scientific method and therefore no amount of conversation was making any progress. And it was a total waste of my time, a total waste of their time. And I finally you know, stopped communicating with them. And that's a case where you guys shouldn't have been communicating. Exactly. Because, but I wanted to find out why it wasn't working. And the answer took me a long time to figure out they were departing from the protocols of the scientific method in subtle but profound ways. But so to add to that, the importance of stopping the communication is that both of you can go on to do more relevant things. So if they right. want to keep trying and who knows, maybe they'll discover something that you hadn't thought of. You know, I'm just, you know, that possibility always has to be out there. Yeah. You're not stopping them because it's not hurting you. And you're going on to what would be more useful for you to be doing. And that's what we need to do in conversations that we don't do enough. It made a very interesting story of just the discovering the way they were departing from the scientific method and what that meant to the outcome of their work. So the, the real outcome was the meta outcome. The, the discovery that this was a very subtle but profound departure from the scientific method. That's the real story. And that, to my mind, is the more important story. Not about cold fusion. Josh. I would venture to say you found the same thing with Wikipedia when you yes. ask Jimmy Wales about the ethics. Is exactly. it, we're going to create an encyclopedia for the world, yeah. is it going to be built on an ethical framework? Exactly. And the story was, we don't do ethics here. I literally had one of the very high level uh, officials say Wikipedia doesn't do ethics. And that's why I brought up Yuval Ferrari as he wrote in his book is that for groups or nation states to have a belief system, you have to buy into that belief system in order to move forward. So if all the people in Cold Fusion believe that they can skirt the scientific method ever so subtly in order to continue the project, then they can work together. Yeah. Whereas it separates the people that can and can't, and then they form nation states around those beliefs and borders and lines to cross. Like if you cross you know, a boundary line, if you cross this line, you're in this belief system. If right. you cross this line, you're in this belief system. And these governance of laws affect this area and this affects this area. And that's, that's and that, why we go to war. Yeah. That story was both a tragedy and a comedy. Initially it was a tragedy. But eventually it became a comedy because the way that they departed was hilarious. But, you, but it was hard to see how funny it was, how, how much irony was in it. So it ended up becoming a comedy and a funny story, but also a sad story.
Yep. It's a com comic tragedy or tragic comedy, whatever the hybrid thing is. <laughs> I wrote that in a rap song. I said, how many times does life bring you down? War and desperation, all hearing the sound. War and desperation, fear is a commodity. Is it a drama or is it a comedy? It's, there you go. Yeah. Turned out to be a little both. Initially, that's the way I crashed. felt about the Homeland Security. I, I downloaded yeah. the entire Patriot Act. I highlighted it. I went to the political science major at my university, gave him my highlighted the whole entire Homeland Security Act and said, what does this actually mean? And he looked it over, we had lunch the next day and he said, a lot of rights will be eroded in the constitution if this gets enacted. Yeah. And I said, it's already been enacted. He went, what the fuck, oh shit. <laughs> exactly. And then I watched the rights erode in my lifetime. This was in 2001 and I watched them slowly. And then I met a uh, civil rights lawyer who started the civil rights defense committee in Northampton, Massachusetts to get overturn the Patriot Act. And he spent seven years trying to do that, got nowhere, ran against Nancy Pelosi, got nowhere, ran against her again to try to be in Congress and got nowhere. He got me too And And uh, it's, it's a hard thing to overturn laws once they're enacted. And that's the big debate I've been seeing in the last five to 10 years is once a law gets into power and into place, and that's why I mentioned last week the comment period of the United States where rules can be put into a town hall, much like we're having here where we're talking about things. I think that's where the GCC can thrive and be successful is we can bring up topics that are not sexy or not in the zeitgeist at that moment, but deserve a discussion and deserve to be discussed across multiple cities not just in the united states but hopefully throughout the world that's the global challenge is can we get these conversations happening all over the world and then can we meet up and have a discussion and have representatives even if it's informal to keep these conversations going to me that's the the scariest thing is if these conversations die that's where the idea of a representative democracy dies. Yep. There, there's it's oligarchy and fascism and Putin's and Trump's and those kind of dictators. The uh, yeah, we can go on with how those things go. We all know how dictators how that ends. It ends badly. They make the rules and it ends badly. You know, you put up a set of rules and without even reading the rules, I'd say this is going to go chaotic eventually. Mathematically, I can predict that without explaining exactly how, when, and where it's going to go chaotic because rule-based systems are inherently chaotic when pushed to their extreme. Yep. And I think Sam said it best with self-correcting systems. That's what he's been talking about. And yep. I, I would like to enact a self-correcting system that goes for the good, leans back towards the bad, and then comes back to the good again. And we have different times of at least we're on a journey together through that process. <laughs> yeah. I think that's to me what a good governance system is something that is more flexible than it is a rule. Flexible, that, that agility and flexibility and adaptability are very powerful ideas and you do not find them in hard and fast rules. Yeah. And that's, that's the fundamental failure of rule-based systems. They're not adaptable, flexible, they, they, they don't change when the conditions change. New they become rule. obsolescent. You must be flexible. You must be adaptable. New rule. Exactly. Now, <laughs> does your dog care about you Ukraine? Up. Is your dog concerned and worried about Ukraine? In her own he says, way. Could care less, right? He says, why does he love me so much? I'm a dog. Ignorance Doesn't he know he's a person? <laughs> <laughs> if you're uh, not depressed, you're not paying attention. No. It's dog a precious thing. Attention to world politics. Yeah. Smart the dog, dog pays dog attention to Sam, up. and Sam pays attention to world politics. So, so yes, it affects the dog. But if Sam is sad, the dog will notice that and respond. That's right. That's right. Do you notice. have your hand up, Josh? Because I was going to say something. No, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, with what Barry said uh, about systems and rules and hard and fast rules 
which I consider to be very, um, you know, yes and no, multiple choice at the best, maybe. Um, then, you know, where if you have feedback where it can change the variability of what's happening, now you're talking about AI systems, right? So, you know, systems that can learn, um, systems that can be more complicated. Right. And typically, Typically, the AI up until today has been, you know, relatively one-to-one, -one, you know, showing bugs, growing bugs. But if it gets to go too, I don't know if the human interaction is always going to be necessary to qualify if the nuance of these new set of rules, which will always be rules and rules and rules, it's just, is there just one set of four choices or is this a fractal type of thing, like a function that could call another function? And maybe someday, if I need to, I'll call another function. But right now, I don't have to. This is far enough for today. Yeah, uh, I'll just add on to what you said, Colin, is uh, I was just researching last night how to build your own blockchain. So it's a JavaScript program built in Visual Basic that creates a hash and then builds blocks upon that and validates each block so that if someone tried to tamper with that system, it will show a true or false. If it's a true blockchain, it has not been tampered with. And I'm noticing people are trying to build an entire web three on this notion of creating blocks that aren't tampered with so that information cannot be manipulated in a way that is not open to the public. It's not distributed to everybody where everyone can see what happened. And I don't know if that's the right way to go is to put trusted contracts and blocks on things. I find it a very inefficient way to keep track of information, but I do think it's worth it to write some sort of script or program that we agree upon is that making sense just, to people? Quick, just quickly, Josh. Um, yep. The only thing I think special about the blockchain um, over, say, something like Git, which does the same thing with hashes and tracking to make sure, or you could say, you know, any kind of a fingerprint of something to say, if this changes, I'll know it, where the blockchain actually calculates these things in a way to make it a game that these farmers try to find a solution to a puzzle and they make these puzzles more harder as computers get faster which is kind of it's so that they don't have collisions um, and things and double spending it's quite complicated the shit they got to do just to get around human gaming of the system uh, and that's where 90 percent of the effort is the human gaming of that hash table that it the hash doesn't get built in the way that they can't control it and that's what all the the magic is in this farm is to control the way that Lego gets snapped together in a way you can guarantee that the right people are doing the snapping and verify it in the wallets and things. GitHub's the same way. You look at my code, I can go back to where I started and you know I can write freely, make some mistakes, make some commits and rewind it. Say, well, that was a bad idea. So it gives you a lot of freedom when you can track what you're doing digitally and rewind it. Uh, it's kind of the same idea of conversations, isn't it? <clears throat> Wait, Colin, I don't understand that. You can't rewind. You can't unstack ledgers in blockchain. No, no, no. I can go back to an early point and say what I just did was a waste, potentially. But it didn't stop me from going back and, and picking up where I left off. Sometimes you're in design experimental mode. You do stuff, you know, and if you know that, okay, I'm just going to, even if you're going to work on a bug, say you could stash the stuff you're working on right now, stash it away in some place, you know, you can get that back. Your whole workspace changes that git does this weird stuff copies all the stuff moves it off fingerprints it then you got a clean workspace you pull out a new branch you make your bugs whatever you commit the bug fix then you pull your code back off the you know the stash and you're right back to where you were so there's there's many ways of being able to cryptographically manage the flow so and so that you know that the flow is the flow and hasn't been tampered with. It's the gaming that people will do. Like if I get somebody on my, my team and they try to, you know, 
make a thousand bots to commit to the same repository at the same time and they break it. Well, that's what they have. That's the problems they got to deal with with the blockchain. And also the blockchain is another feature where they write contracts, which are the programs that run on there and they can make money by enforcing these cryptographic objects. I think, isn't the uh, NFTs a little bit like that too? Just well, Yeah, just to go further, I think what I'm talking about is a, I'm a, Put the acronym there d-o-k-r which would be decentralized autonomous knowledge repository so a place where we're storing the knowledge of the conversations for everyone to use that can be moved anywhere that are decentralized and it's not living on say github's repository which is microsoft so now I think you're speaking to the question I wanted to ask I just want to clarify sure, sure. things for Sam or Josh when when you talk about D3, within people work, Web3, within people working there, is there a split between those who want open source and don't, those who don't? Is there, are there two not, like, is it two separate issues? That's a great question. And what I see is the idea of Web3 is it's all open. It's all built on an open network. But does everybody that's working on that feel that way? That's my question. They're is that, defining is that, it that way. Is that, I'm saying, is it a characteristic of yes. when I hear, and Sam's saying no, and that's why, I see, this is interesting. See, I'm so, getting- so, so, I think so, if you define banking and finance institutions and governments, they will always need to, quote unquote, be private and, uh, quote unquote, protected. Well, but that's different. But then well, they're going to, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. We can sit and go into some opinion of what Web3 should be, or we can realize there is a system right now that is not. So if you did the equation, the system we have right now in world governance and finance is not decentralized and autonomous and open sourced. And they're trying to build a separate, you can call it game B, you can call it another system. People have even talked about Putin wanting to build some sort of system outside of the fiat currency of the United States dollar representing petroleum dollars because their main export is petroleum in Russia, that they want to be on a separate system. And this is the beginning of them trying to build that separate system and getting away from the American uh, control of the entire financial system of the world. I think Stacey was asking a different question. Stacey, can you ask your question again? I wanted to know if it was two separate issues. I mean, the answer I got is yes, it's two separate things. That just because you're working on Web3 does not mean that you believe that everything should be open source. So within, you know, that's all. I, I just want to make sure that two different things. Yeah, I mean, that argument's been around for 40 years. Say it again. I don't think that I don't think that changes with Web three. This whole open source, closed source business has been around for four right. decades. Well, I didn't know because <laughs> hey, I'm just, I'm just learning how to use Zoom. I'm so. not criticizing. I'm just stating this that it's it's not changing because it's a it's a long standing phenomenon. Okay, and what people mistakenly believe is that open source is an economic model. It's not an economic model. Okay. It was never intended to be an economic model. It was a place where geeks could actually show other geeks that they knew what they were doing and appreciated the beauty of good engineering and good software. And goodwill. It turned into supporting growth in other, other means, but it never started as an economic move. And I think so that's what me, a lot of people misunderstand. Well, let me just tell you why it's important to me. It'll take one second, Barry. It's important to me because it speaks to the core values of a person that I'm speaking to. And I need to know that for me. I would be Barry. careful with that because uh, people can support closed source, people can support open source. Uh, it's it's but, not as simple as just saying it's just one or the I'm other. I'm not saying it's as simple. I'm saying I needed to know if it was even the same thing. Of course, it's not as simple. So first I would ask, you know, I needed to know that. My next question would be why? And then I'd listen to their reasoning and see, you know, learn. I don't judge people based on one answer to one question. Mm -hmm. What was your original assumption? I missed that. Sorry. 
Um, you're, it, I just wanted to know if the phrase encapsulated the fact that something was opened or closed. That's it. Oh. Yeah, and the phrase that I'm saying is it's decentralized, meaning right. nobody actually owns it. They were making copies of it and shoving it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So if someone says, who owns this book? We all own the book because it's in all of our houses. It's decentralized. Yeah, and other blockchains have been made, like Holochain, where they have their proof of stake or validation within their sub network. If you're part of that sub network, you're part of that branch and you can be validated um, in different ways than having to have everybody validated all at once, if I'm not mistaking it. I think you can have different size federations, um, similar to, I guess what, uh, I won't conflate that. So, and the deal is when people try to game Holochain, they just split off and make their own chain and they've just put themselves on an island of one. So there's, there are different ways to attack these things. And that's basically the way code is too. Like once you branch off, that's an idea of one now and you can branch that off and you can merge that back because the software is smart enough to help you do that and rewind it again. So it's like having this specialized editor that can rewind things. And essentially that's the history, right? So it's very transparent. When you look at a book after it was written you, and you wondered what it looked like on the, you know, say a 10 chapter book and you're an author and you wonder what it looked like a year ago and you only had the sketch going, you could rewind it and find out. And you look at them both at the same time, two different repositories and compare them. What did I learn? It's yeah, endless to what you can do. I was just gonna give an example of two examples of open and closed source. If you, wrote, if you write your own autobiography, by definition, that's closed source because it's an autobiography. But if, if you have a biography up on Wikipedia, that's sort of open source because many people can edit it and contribute to it. Ironically enough, if it's about you, you can't be one of the editors of your own biography on Wikipedia. So that's one example of open and closed sources is an autobiography versus a biography. Another good example though, I met a chap named Bram Cohen. Bram Cohen invented a file transfer protocol. It was an innovative idea for file transfer. And he wrote the first client, it's called BitTorrent. And so the very first BitTorrent was written by the guy who, in, who conceived of it and invented it. But it was also open source because anybody could write a, um, a compatible client that could talk to all the other uh, BitTorrent uh, clients. So that was an example that starts closed source because one guy conceives it, writes the first version, and then it becomes open source after that because it's not a secret. And it's pieces because he wrote an engine and then he built a car around it. He said, well, you can build your own cars around this engine. Yeah. And that's what they did. And the engine was just a protocol, I think, essentially. Yeah, and to, to continue with that, the um, hypertext transfer protocol was a protocol that was given out as open source. Okay. And then in the music industry, there's the MIDI music instrument digital interface protocol of how instruments can talk to other instruments. That was open sourced, which there's certain protocols that are tested and they work and then they're given out to the public. And I found out recently by studying the patent laws in the United States of America, the reason why Tesla opened up their patents is so patent trolls can't sue them because they're open sourced. So he opened up for electric cars, all of these different patents on engines and motors and ways to build electric vehicles and electric systems open source so that everyone can build these open source and it, I think it's more, it's not the protocol of whether it's a biography or an autobiography, it's more the distribution of the book itself, if that makes sense, Barry. Yeah, that, I mean, you've got TCP IP, open source, HDMI, high definition media interface, open source, USB, open source. The concept is developed, now in those cases, I think it was developed by committees. Uh, NTSC video was developed by committees, but a lot of them are, are a single uh, genius, you know, uh, conceives of it, writes the first version of it, but doesn't doesn't try to patent it. 
And you really can't patent ideas. You can patent an implementation, but not the idea. So if you can understand the idea, you can, you can reduce it to practice with a separate uh, implementation. And that's what and happens. So people, a lot of things do go open source eventually. They become standards. And then you get people, get people on the opposite side who try to put DRMs on things and throttle things. What's DRM? Whose network? Digital, digital, digital rights management. management. Yeah. It, yeah, Sony got in a big trouble with that, on I think. Entertainment. Yeah. Thank yeah, I think you. I think Sam was telling a big thing about the Sony they got into. Uh, was it? Were you telling the story on that one time, Sam? I don't know who was telling that story here. I've heard it somewhere a couple of times. Where Sony um, they put DRM on on their products. Some some hackers broke it, and then it went to court. Is that right? Maybe you know, Josh. You you know, in this stuff. I'm not I'll, aware. I'll look it up. Yeah, but this Sony thing, the DRM, that's you know, digital rights management, it came out like, do people have a right to make a copy of their, if they bought it, do they have a right to make a copy of it? it was yeah, that's copyright law. To. There's a whole copyright law, intellectual property law. <clears throat> yeah, so and companies will try to do that. And internet companies, they'll, uh, or ISPs or Apple or Google or whoever, Facebook, whoever owns the pipes can, uh, you know, perhaps, if you pay enough money or if you're not the you know you can be throttled and priority traffic and that's something i think net neutrality is that part of what that whole shebang is about net neutrality so i think net neutrality is a huge issue for the future as well as patenting of what we can do with our data and what is data yeah, I'm just in the sake of brevity because I know we're getting up towards 10 o'clock. Just as a macro view, starting off with you know this war that's going on that's affecting all of our lives at this moment in time. To look at what a possibility or a potential, not that we're there now or we might not reach it in our generation, but I would like to think that these giant, huge servers that Google owns, that Facebook owns, that Amazon owns, at some point, 100 years into the future, we could serve up that amount of information on a device that lives inside of our house and that we get to a society where that much information and that much of a pipeline of communication could be distributed equally and not owned by these giant, large trillion dollar corporations. And that's something I would love to talk about. And that's why I brought up, Sam, the uh, idea of putting the GCC into a trust for future generations to build towards some sort of large goal like that. I know that sounds outlandish, but I would like to see that coming forward. And I do see a lot of you know, major breakthroughs in computer processing just in the last year that could see like a calculator in uh, the eighties was brought to China. They cost $800 and people were giving them away because they were $20 here in America. And that helped the entire country of China to get really smart. <laughs> So this was a three terabyte external USB hard drive. I didn't even buy this. A guy gave it to me with surplus. He'd already gone to the next technology. Three terabytes just sitting here in my hand. Yep, I've got uh, the. Oh, Josh froze again. He was going to talk about something very small. <laughs> You're very alive small. again. Whatever you were going to talk about, you froze. So. Oh, sorry. I was just saying it's the size of my thumbnail is the micro USB that you have to put into another little SD thing just to put into a computer. It's so tiny. And I put those into all my cameras and my, you know, flying drones. And But the cost, 128 I'm just my mind is blown 128 gigabytes size of my thumbnail and they cost $32 and they're, and they're fast they're not the first generation these are faster third generation USB 3 yeah. I mean it's it's I getting thought, and that's yeah. five-year-old technology <laughs> yeah I, so I just we're getting that there. not this long is ago. real I bought a 64 gig and now it's up to 264 right yeah, and the Raspberry yeah. Pis are now five dollars for the miniature version of a Raspberry Pi. Five dollars for an entire computer that, when I was a kid, we had a little jar 
for Radio Shack, the Tandy computer that was at Radio Shack, we were saving up for it. Our whole family would put money into the jar to try to get a Tandy computer from Radio Shack. Are you telling me, I gotta check that out. I thought that not with all the Wi-Fi and everything on chip for $5. Not a Raspberry, you mean, must mean just a processor. Anyway, it's we're a, it's a miniature look version of the Raspberry Pi for $5. And it comes. Yeah, with I've seen some of those things. The, board. Yeah, the microcontroller, but not what, that's what you pay for all the little things and the niceties. But anyway, in the development board, all ready to go. Wi-Fi, four USB hookups. That's I think still fifty six. Yeah, and and they're building new chip factories in America. They have a three year plan for multiple chip factories to be built in America and all around the world. So they're not stopping the building of it. And I do think that's a big part of the war in Ukraine. If you look at the actual resources that Ukraine has. For raw materials and minerals, um, Ukraine's pretty rich country in raw materials, and there, there's a reason why Russia would like to take that over moving forward. What? Well, they 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 missed it from their purse when it got stolen from them. You mean? <laughs> uh, it's a hard one. I assume you're hearing from both sides of the conversation. Yep, and Sam's got his hand up. Well, just when we were speaking, I got an email here. I just read the headline. It says, Russia issues ominous warning to Finland and Sweden should they join NATO. So he's now threatening Finland and Sweden. I don't know what he's trying to accomplish here. Sam, were you on the call when Tice gave a whole um, rundown oh, nice. for 25 minutes about the 1939 war? In, uh, it must have been on a Sunday. No, I did yeah, not remember. That was last, doing that. Okay, last Sunday. I don't know if Doug is posting them fast enough, but uh, he gave, a, you know, Tice doesn't speak very often. So when he did, it was quite profound. And the history of Russia, and I believe it was Sweden. Do you, maybe someone else here remembers. I'm sorry, my brain is shot at the moment. But 1939, there was a big conflict. <laughs> And it's interesting how they resolved that conflict in 1939 by changing the government and actually making agreements. But this is heating up to be World War III. I mean, there's no yep. doubt about it. This is the beginning. Yep. Yeah. Well... I'm not surprised he warned the United States. I'm not surprised he's warning anybody who sticks their neck out just before they think that they can get. But the question is, how much does he plan on taking? Does he have a solid plan? Or is it something they're just going to play as they go? Play it by, you know. Like, does he say, I, I got to, we're kind of, we just want to take back Ukraine. But, you know, there's like seven or other, other things around there, too. So depending on how it goes, we might be able to get a few more if we scare people. I don't How know. much do we know, know about dealing with bullies? The what? Yeah. How much do we know about dealing with bullies? Yeah, and how much do we know about the two pipelines, the Nord 1 and Nord 2 pipeline for all of the energy well, in Europe? Dealing with bullies, I think you have to walk right up and hit them around the end of the fucking nose, don't you? If you can make sure he's not going to come back with other bullies and you know hit you back harder. Well... I heard that it takes the Russian nukes X minutes to get to the United States and it takes the United States X divided by five to get to Russia. I'm just wondering though, would Mahatma Gandhi's approach have succeeded with Putin? Gandhi's approach? A I, I don't think so because if you have an autocrat who manifests the so-called dark tetrad the psychological profile of the dark tetrad, essentially nothing works. Is it a tetrad or a triad? You're saying four tetra? Well, it was originally called the dark triad. It was psychopathy, narcissism, and uh, Machiavellianism. And if you add that? sadism, that's the fourth of the mix of the dark Ooh. tetrad. And so if you, you throw in sadism as the fourth one, you get the dark tetrad. And so you get Stalin and Hitler and um, Putin and Trump and Trump, you get essentially the, you know, examples of the dark tetrad and there's nothing you can do about them. They're never gonna change. They're gonna be autocrats or wanna be autocrats and ruthless. They're uh, ruthless to the, to the bitter end. They're not they're gonna- Obviously supported, they're supported by somebody somehow. 
yes, there are people who support the bully, the autocrat, the strong man. You go to a lot of places and you get the strong man gets the power. Pretty commonplace. We get the ashes. Human we history. get the ashes. Ashes to ashes. They all fall down. So, you know. So I think there is a place for nonviolence, and I'm not sure that every place is a place for nonviolence. The future is a place for it, but the yeah. present, not yet. <laughs> if we can get there, if we can get there. Um, Stephen Hawking thought our, our culture had maybe a, a millennium left. Before he died, he had reduced it down to a, a century. Uh, Sagan thought we weren't going to make it. Neil deGrasse Tyson was asked the same question. He waffled on the amount of time, but he says maybe a couple hundred years before curtains, before the uh, you know the closing curtain rings down on humankind and right. separation. So in that light, then how do you view what Elon is trying to do? Musk. Yes. I, I, I don't really have a good model of Musk. I mean, he's he's got a lot of chutzpah. Um, he's also got a lot of money because he made a lot of money on his early projects. I don't know. I, I don't think he's evil. Uh, I think he may be overconfident about what can be accomplished. I, I, would, I, would, I would put my money on uh, Dean Kamen before I put my money on Elon Musk, even though Dean Kamen didn't make a lot of money. He did a lot more good for people who needed um, right, but point. you just cited a number of smart people to say we're you know either decades or hundreds or centuries from extinguishing ourselves. Right. And so Musk clearly believes that. And so he's trying to get us or he's trying to get himself and a few of his closest friends oh, to tomorrow. a place where he can still survive. I think that's yeah, I think that's well, nuts. I think that's, that's crazy. Actually not what he's doing. I think he gets <laughs> misinterpreted. What he's really doing is trying to build infrastructure so that we can have 100 space launches per day. He's trying to build a massive infrastructure. He went to Russia to buy one of these rockets in order to go up into space. And then he built a space company to build the rocket itself because of his braggioso. Like he just thought I'll 3D print it myself. And then he did. And he barely squeaked by one launch. If the last launch didn't work, that would have been the end of the company. And that launch worked. And then he got the contracts. But now he's building the largest rocket. I don't know if anyone watched the display two weeks ago of his new rocket. It's, it's orders of magnitude different of payload up into space from 18 foot in diameter to 30 feet in diameter. And the orders of magnitude of moving things off planet, it's not really about Mars as much as the ability to make that a reality if we wanted to, but the technology of getting rocket ships, one of the things he wants to do is make travel on Earth 30 minutes from any destination on Earth of blasting off and then falling to that part of Earth and then getting out and having lunch in Tokyo and then blasting off, falling back down and being back home in Los Angeles. It's an expensive lunch. <laughs> Very expensive. But, but these ideas are so outlandish. Yeah. It takes the amount of iteration and, you know, flexibility to build these rockets that they're doing. It's really fascinating if you look at, you know, videos of uh, the everyday astronaut that explains all 19 rocket boosters that have been created and how they're iterating on these boosters in order to push this much payload which there's a, a view of life that I see, you know, a lot of people talked about years ago, but I start to see it coming to reality is manufacturing gets pushed off planet and everything is manufactured up in space and then drops down through gravity and gets distributed. So imagine all his cars are built on some giant mega factory floating up in space with robots and the cars just drop down and get distributed to that area. I mean, it's it's outlandish and crazy. That's why Elon Musk is just looked at as a lunatic. Yeah. But he's doing hard mathematics and the physics to actually bring giant payloads up to build one of these factories in space. Literally pie in the sky. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, made in space, if anyone has checked that out, they're putting organs that are self-replicating actual 
biological organs in space that can't be 3D printed on Earth because of gravity, but the way they 3D print them in space, they can actually live. And if you can bring living organs back down for the health of humans, I mean, these are some crazy ideas, but this is, I think the new, I, I noticed the new generation, they're all on board with this because they, they don't know that they can't. They're like uh, hummingbirds. They don't know that they're not allowed to fly. So they just fly. I mean, it's so inefficient. That's the way I look at Elon Musk. It's like a hummingbird. He's using so much energy to flap his wings and do so much. It works. The hummingbirds are amazing. But if all birds were hummingbirds, I don't think we'd have a great ecosystem. Hmm. I don't know. I've watched Thunderfoot Foot quite a bit. If you know who he is, he's got a YouTube channel, Thunderfoot. And he's got quite a few videos on Elon Musk debunking his grandioso claims and other science things as well. He's pretty, he's a sciencey guy. Um, what do you think, Colin, of the mega factory, the giga factory that he just built in Austin, Texas? Have you seen the drone footage yeah. of that? Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm kind of on the fence because I see this, this guy attacking him for his claims on science, but it's almost like how much of Elon Musk is a scientist and how much is he a, a businessman? He's an entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. I think he so. mastered business and that's easy to him. He says money is simple. It's not even, it's a fiction that he mastered. Now he's trying to master the physics of building a massive plant made of all robots that can pump out transportation devices that look like iPhones on wheels that can float yeah. around quietly on the surface of the planet and get an upgrade through the air to be more efficient and battery regulation and software regulation. He's already accomplished that with over 1.5 million. I think he's got almost 2 million of these devices collecting data with eight different cameras going into a large supercomputer that he built himself called the dojo computer and they're collecting all of the data of everyone driving these vehicles on earth right now and he's planning to ramp it up to over three million a year so Amazing. this is just the beginning well his is uh it's, it's almost like he i'm almost thinking he did this hyperloop as a joke but it couldn't have been a joke well, that, that's that's neither here nor there. His boring company just got a contract in Florida. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so no. I know he's into so many things. It's not even. It's not even possible to, to um, stereotype him. Really, he's like many things. And I'm thinking if I'm almost looking at his failures and ridiculousness as marketing. Well, can you imagine if Russia, instead of going to war, built seven of his gigafactories over in Russia, and took the money that they would have to spend on war? and instead spent that money on building gigafactories, they could have a good lock of the European electric market if they built giant battery factories in Russia. I mean, I was going to say to be a little, little more, um, I guess, general about the crisis of the planet and solving the, what the energy needs and typically solving some kind of a balance that governments must have to face between what we need and what we want and what we're doing about it and we're kind of relying on the entrepreneurs to recognize the need and fill it because the economy drives that but i think that equation doesn't serve all mark all all domains well you know what i'm saying so when it comes to like science and things like that it, you know canada kind of has it more government the medical system when it comes to drug companies and things like these larger, huge things. And I think energy is another one of those information is another one of those, right? Education yeah. is another one of those. Well, um, policing if, is another one of those. If you extrapolate out the ideas of Nikolai Tesla being used at the Tesla company. And one of Tesla's big ideas was a giant electric. Um, I forgot what he called it. It's a, uh, the ability to protect a whole city with electrical forces. So in case missiles come in, they could zap them out of the air. What was that yeah. called, Barry? His uh, giant? Like an electromagnetic shield of some sort? Yeah, it's um, the t Tesla coil, I think it was called. 
Well, yeah, I know yeah, what a Tesla yeah, that, coil is. That, that. that doesn't do that. Tesla coil is just a big, big inductor. Right, but his grandiose idea that he had plans for and he was doing at Wardenclyffe was trying to build a tower that could protect from missiles coming in. Yeah, and, and, and like an EMS bomb or something, shoot, shoot uh, radio frequency signals at something to disable it. Yeah, like shooting radar except it's yeah. much more high, much more powerful beam. Like a, you can shoot, you know, shoot a laser, shoot microwaves, you know, shoot some kind of EM wave at the at the well chosen frequency that would. Okay, okay. I have to interrupt. EM pulse. I heard years ago that Russia was experimenting with EMP pulses, like from planes with these great big magnetic discs. Is that, yeah. is that was that? Is that true? There was an idea for EMP bombs that a bomb would basically deliver a big EMP that would disable electronic machinery, but not kill people, for example. Right. right. So it would disable. That's what I'm thinking. Would, if, if that's, what, would, what if that's the bomb he has? He's going to fly over Norway and Sweden and just kind of knock out their banking exchange for a couple of days. I mean, if you could send down mm -hmm. a 60 hertz pulse or a or a, a, a small engine multiple of 60 hertz, hertz pulse, you might be able to uh, disrupt the electric power grid. Yeah, a lot of things. For example, without bothering people, because 60 hertz radio waves don't bother people, but they'll, in, they'll cause an induction in an electric power transformer, for example. I guess it's sort of like a simulation of a sunburst, right? Yeah. Well, Elon Musk knows about that. That killed 40 of his rockets, 40 of his satellites. Yeah. That was a plasma wind. And then the space garbage. Let's not talk about the space garbage. Well, no, they don't have space garbage because they actually are built to uh, burn up the atmosphere. So that's the one good thing he thought about space garbage is he let them drop back no down way, and burn no up. way i've asked that question several times and i never got that answer yep i've never seen that well they're small so they do burn up when they re-enter yeah i did four of them made it though. up yeah he has an ion drive that pushes them upwards and right 40 of them the drives were not going to work to get them up to the right altitude so right. he dropped them down and let them burn up right but once they're up there they're up there right does he have to keep uh, tweaking them yeah he I, think, has I guess to, they do anyway it has to stay in orbit so they have to keep yeah. going up and then once they're no longer functioning they burn out into the atmosphere yeah they well, have I they, like fuel say, on board. that's right well so that's yeah and that's the thing with m many of these probes that once they're i was amazed at the voyagers though 40 years like they just they just twinkled I, I think we're in the death throes of an old economy that's moving into a new economy that no one knows what it's going to be. I'm sure Putin has a plan for the new economy. He must, because he wouldn't have pulled this attack if he didn't have some sort of plan he was working on for eight years since the first coup happened in the Ukraine in 2013, 2014. And uh, I think that there's going to be wow. a new system that gets built out of all of this that none of us could have ever imagined. I, I can't imagine it. I'm also I'm wondering if it's simply trying to reassemble the Soviet Union again after yeah. Gorbachev let it fall apart. He's trying to reassemble it. Yeah. Right, right. Naomi Klein talked about the shock and awe. Do you remember that? Or the shock doctrine, sorry. That was a book she wrote. You guys remember that? Did you give that the any credence? What? doctrine shock doctrine oh, yeah shock and awe? The, the, no well it, it's it's premised on that idea but it's a shock to our daily lives like 9 11 was one where then the government can implement a plan that they've had now josh says he has this plan for years what are the chances that he's just riding this out on the end of covid just before, you know, he thought it might have got worse. He might have been able to do some things. And, you know, suppose we could use this COVID for, it's not really a shock, is it? Maybe well, just well, maybe What are the chances that now. his son is on an energy board in Russia? Um, his son, meaning Joe Biden's son, who's our current um, CEO <laughs> of the United States. 
<laughs> what are the chances uh, that he was on the board of something? I don't gas prom or something like that. Yeah, yep. I'm just saying to me, it's so simple. It's just about fuel. And we see all the major transportation companies in the world, all the car companies moving to electric power. And we see that solar has dropped down to where it's actually affordable now as an alternative fuel system and a resource and an energy system. And we see the change is happening. But right now, the natural gas pipeline, the Nord 1 and the Nord 2, is going to Europe. And Europe depends on that. And if you can take control of that through the Ukraine, you could possibly take control of all of Europe. And I think that's what his plan is ultimately is to, yep. you know, right. Brexit did the break off of the European Union. But if he can get the entire European Union to be dependent on Russia, then that gives the power to go into Africa with China. And uh, Actually, yeah, I heard that uh, he might take them both, but I heard that one of the things he had to do is he had to wait till he built the second pipeline because if he would attack before that they would have cut him off it's global politics that i am not an expert in i just but yeah, want to take but of... once you once you take once you got one you can go take the other you're right and then you control them both well once china well, moves than one, to too. electric power <laughs> which is why they got a gigafactory of tesla cars there and they have a huge massive economy of electric vehicles being shipped over if you go on alibaba you can get a truck for two thousand eight hundred dollars it's an electric truck that you can buy through the mail that will come to your house it's a piece of shit but you can put another two grand into it and it'll, it's a vehicle that will run i think colin dropped off Oh, I think so. Yeah. Colin dropped off in the middle of your response to him. Well, my point, Barry, is just I think we're moving into a new economy that's going to take 20 to 50 years to move into. And this is the last death throes of the old petrol based economy and rush hold of that for the future of their nation. Well, what I can anticipate is eventually a pretty good breakthrough in converting solar photons to DC electricity. And then we, our houses will, will convert from AC to DC and we won't need these uh, high, uh, high energy, high voltage transcontinental uh, power lines. We'll be generating enough DC power locally. And the, see, the nice thing about DC is that unlike AC, well, if you wanna hook up your, your power supply to the grid, you gotta get it in phase. DC is not an issue. You can just hook up DC to DC, and as long as it's the same voltage, you don't have to worry about hooking up out of phase and blowing everything out. You have to synchronize your AC. That's really tricky. When you bring a new power uh, unit back online, you not only have to get it up to 60 hertz, you have to get it up to 60 hertz in phase without everything else. And if you hook it up out of phase, you know, it's good by, good by power yeah. plant. So, yeah, I've been... I've been following this battery tech. It's getting really interesting. All, all these new type of batteries. And a lot of people think it's, you know, lithium is mostly lithium. It's kind of like saying salad is mostly salad dressing. Like it's not all lithium. It's mostly nickel and, yeah. and other. But we need a big breakthrough in, in capturing solar photons and converting them either directly to DC power or converting them uh, to hydrogen and oxygen or maybe methane or ethane. Um, so I think everyone's, I mean, from what I can see is uh, economists talk about, you know, America borrowed so much money in debt for the future. So we're deeply in debt, same with China, same with a lot of countries. And I think we're going to have to build a new economy yes. off of new technologies that have yet to be finalized, created, distributed, marketed a new energy economy. And I think it's going to be solar ultimately once we get the breakthrough, not just converting photons to electricity, but converting photons to hydrocarbons. Yeah. Artificial photosynthesis. We haven't, we have, we're not as good as a, as a green leaf in converting photons into uh, hydrocarbons. It's going to be interesting. And uh, I'm wondering you know, this whole thing with Chernobyl being in the Ukraine, if uh, there's some sort of plan that Putin has in order to bring online new nuclear type of power that creates more 
new nuclear bombs. I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm very concerned about the future of energy. I didn't even know that they had rebuilt a new Chernobyl power plant. I thought that when the one, when the other one, you know, uh, melted down, that that was the end of Chernobyl. Evidently, there's a there's an existing, working Chernobyl power plant. I'm learning that from you right now. I did not know that it was working. Yeah, because the when the Russians invaded, the one of the first pieces of territory they seized is the Chernobyl power plant. Mm. And I, you know, I. I didn't read far enough to know if it's a conventional power plant or, or a nuclear power plant, but there is a Chernobyl power plant, big one. Wow. Who just came back? Stacy came back. I've been here, I've just been listening. Oh, but back. yeah. I muted because I had sirens going off in the background. But I have to get off anyway. <laughs> okay. But um, it was nice seeing you all. Let me come back for a minute. Thank you, Stacy. Nice to see you. Thanks for answering my questions. It was it was helpful. Yeah, and if you want, I just got this really interesting diagram. I'm happy to share with you. Someone made a list of all the new Web three technologies. And they put this giant map, and I'll send it to you uh, on a I Facebook Messenger. That. Thank you. you. I appreciate that. I'm going to keep it on the background in case you guys stay on a little bit longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pretty happy with my technologies, meaning uh, the Internet was going out. So I switched over to Starlink back to the uh, cable Internet. And then just now my iPad died and there was a button now on Zoom that says switch from your iPhone to your iPad. So without having to log off and log back in, I just press switch. Oh, that's cool. And it parsed over. Yeah, it's super cool. All right. Well, I, I think we're kind of done because Sam turned off his camera. And really... I'm done too, Barry. If you if you're done, I'm. I got nothing else. I the last bit of knowledge that you just imparted on me was quite profound. Of yeah, uh, the new Chernobyl and see what the technology is, whether it's nuclear or conventional. I don't know which which it is. I've been hearing on that news uh, station uh, on there's a clubhouse room for the Ukraine where people are coming in and out and there's about 200 to 300 people in there at all times 24 hours since the war started and uh, that's where I heard about Chernobyl so uh, I think that's a big factor I think Kiev has an electricity blackout I think they lost their major source of power so people in Kiev are sort of down to you know battery operated stuff or whatever uh, I'm not sure how long it's going to be before if they don't have main power in, in Kiev for, or maybe it's Kharkiv, it's one of those cities, uh, for more than in a week, then basically people can't live there. Yep. And uh, did I hear that the United States is trying to get the Ukrainian president out of Ukraine? Uh, possibly. I think I don't think they're going to publicize uh, that. But he. I heard he refused to leave. Okay. That must be that's, news. That's the latest I've heard is he refused to leave. But I'm just, my concern is that if they try to do some sort of covert operation, make a no fly zone and get him out, and then the Russians, you know, that's how the war really starts is when they take down an, an American military plane to justify us just going in there. Like, you know, that's usually how it happens. Yeah. I'm not going to make any prediction. This is so unpredictable. Even the pundits don't know how to predict it. I'm not making predictions. I, I'm just praying every moment for the lives of all the people, the Russian soldiers, the Ukrainian soldiers, for the people there, for, the, for them to somehow come up with something that makes less lives, yeah. you know, sanctions, everything, just less people have suffering. I just don't want to see any more suffering. Yeah. And that's the one prediction that we're all going to suffer worldwide, not just the Ukrainians, not just the Russians, not just the Europeans, everybody worldwide is going to end up suffering as a result of this conflagration, yep. one way or the other. Yep. Well, hopefully we can continue to dialogue and also create some things that make our lives less sufferable and then our friends and family's lives less sufferable and help each other. Because it's, it, I do see that we're gonna go through some really hard times, even worse yep. than they are now. Right. I'll say one thing before I leave, because it came up at dinner yesterday. In these hard times, the most important thing is community. 
And I think that's important. Solidarity. Uh... Bye. <laughs> Bye, Stacy. Okay. You guys good over there, Barry, in Massachusetts? Is everyone? Well, we had 10 inches of snow yesterday, but that's not a big deal. Today, the sun is out, so. Well, 10 inches is a big deal. That's a lot of snow. It is. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm retired. I don't have to go anywhere. At least seven, six days a week, I don't have to go any place. And one morning a week, I have a commitment at the community center. But, you know, that's, and that's not a life or death thing. I could skip a day Tuesday morning if it was inclement. <laughs> All right. Well, stay warm. Yeah. Well, I've got... My heat pumps are dying. They're 35 years old, so I'm on a backup auxiliary heat, but I'm going to have a guy come out and give me a quote to put in brand new heat pumps. Oh, good. Yeah, I, I got the uh, propane guys coming on Tuesday. We are down to 20% at the house. So. Well, I'm, I'm down to resistance heating, backup resistance heating. So. You have a space heater? What do you have? Uh, Actually, in the the, this room, I, I don't have the main heat turned on upstairs because this is the smallest of the upstairs rooms. So I have um, a space heater under the keyboard table and then another space heater just sitting on the floor behind me. Okay. So and I can turn those on. Right, Actually, right now it's up to 79 in here. So I can, maybe that's because the sun is coming in on the indoor thermometer. I don't think yeah. it's actually, yeah, that's the, it's the sun coming in the window that's making the, well, it's probably, I'm probably closer to 72 in here. I'm loosely affiliated with a group that calls themselves uh, Crowd Doing, and they're having conversations about the solar punk future, where we're all building our own little solar systems, microgrids of solar. So that's yeah. that's kind of where my focus is. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't think we're quite yet ready for solar here. First of all, it's a condo, so I don't own the roof. They're all roofs. And so... At some point, solar technology might be efficient enough that the next time we have to redo the roofs, they'll put in solar, but I'm not expecting that in the next decade. And in the next right. decade, that's sort of the, you know, I'm 77, so my life expectancy is probably less than 90. Well, if, if you need to, if there's some sort of power grid outage, I don't know what how the East Coast is set up exactly. I'm, I can't remember in Massachusetts, but uh, they make $150 to $200 little batteries called Jackery, and they're made with DC power, and you just buy a little $100, 100-watt uh, solar panel, and it will at least charge up your laptop or your phones and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm not too worried. I mean, we, we do occasionally have power outages here, but um, not so much in, in this section. We don't, we don't get the really, really nasty weather in the Northwest suburbs or sufficiently inland. But we, yeah, we get power outages from time to time, usually not very long. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited for the Tesla company to, there's rumors for the last two years about an HVAC system that they're gonna be creating that's affordable for homes. So I hope they, they get on that because I think that's needed just to uh, reduce power consumption if they have a good heating and cooling system. But we'll see. I, you know, the last two months, because I was on resistance heating, I, I paid $900 a month for my electric bill, which is mainly heating. And we'll see after I tell you what it's going to cost to put in the heat pumps. Of course, I won't know what they're going to be like because they won't be put in until really the end of the heating season. So I really won't know until next winter. <laughs> How much I'm going to save on my electric bill. All right. Well, let me know. We uh, rented a house with solar panels. That was one of the, the deals with renting it is that they have the solar panels on. So I'm on solar at the moment. So that's a rental house you're in? Yeah, I'm in a rental house and we're getting ready. I'm actually excited this week. I might be able to go back up to the property depending on the weather. And uh, st my stepdad just, uh, he bought a miniature tractor called a Kanga. It's a one person tractor. Huh? And he's been clearing all the debris with it. His friend came up with an excavator and dug giant holes. And he's been pushing the rubble of our houses into these ditches and then burying it. So, uh, you know, he has to by hand pick out all the metal and the glass and, you know, the steel. And then all of the waste of the burn of all that, the houses. 
push it with this little mini tractor into a dirt ditch and then okay. bury it. I so, see. so we're getting ready to rebuild, meaning this spring is the uh, set your plot lines and where do you want to build? Do we build off the old rubble? Do we build in new places on the property? And then we uh, somehow the neighbors moved and we ended up with another um, 50 acres of property. <laughs> So, oh. so there's 70 acres to Stuart now, Barry. It's a big project. A big, pro yeah, 70 acres. That's huge. Huge, yeah. We're, I, I have 10 acres. My mom has 15 acres, and they just brought another 45 acres. So it's it's a, and they had to buy it because the well is on that 45 acres. So if we didn't buy it and someone else buys it, then we have water right issues. Water, 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 water. So are you going to build a compound there for all, all generations to live in the same compound? I'm going to try. I'm going to try to build out. Um, I don't know if it's a compound as much as just a bunch of little cabins. <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and more of a, my mom calls it ancient oak retreat center. So it's more of a retreat center. But for my daughter's generation and her kids, they, they will be, it's in a family trust. So they'll be stewarding the land which is after putting it in a family trust, I'm like, oh, it'd be great if GCC was in some sort of community trust that, that, you know, like I always think of Alfred Nobel by putting that trust together for the Nobel Peace Prize after making money off dynamite. I always think, you know, how much good has it done for the world and science and technology? I think it's been great. Yeah, so. it's good to be, yeah. What it does is it publicizes important breakthroughs because mm -hmm. the general public wouldn't know about it except for the Nobel Prizes. That's what I hope we do. We publicize the system thinkers on the quote unquote intellectual dark web that we're all connected to, you know, and we get these ideas out, like your ideas that are, you know, sitting on blog posts up on the internet. I think those ideas need to get out there in ways that future generations can grok. Yeah, I don't disagree. They've been getting I these ideas out in different narrative formats for 3,000, 3,500 years. And the only difference is, is that I've re, rewritten them in the language of science and math. This is really the same ideas. Yeah. Just, well, my just goal add, just added the math. Just added the math infrastructure underneath it. When when the Iraq War started, I uh, coined. Um, I called myself DJ Podcaster. So I was taking video of the flip phones from the Iraqi War, and taking the audio, and then putting that into music and then pushing that back out on a radio station and underground until I got taken down from my radio station. It was called five times nights nice radio. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's what I want to do is uh, I'm noticing rapper. There's more rappers than there are musicians out there, but they're talking nonsense. They're just talking with their mouth. If they had something to actually talk about on their albums, yeah. like science and politics and spirituality just things that meant something to society i think we could get the information out that way that's the way i look at it well that's what neil degrasse tyson is doing with his his star talk podcast mm -hmm. i don't I know follow how that watch it, but he's got it out there and there's others there's grant sanderson who's got this fabulous uh, math uh channel on youtube well, look look at uh sam harris joe rogan all these influential podcasters i mean whether we like them or not they have an audience yeah you know sam harris speaks at lectures all over the world and there's a lot of people getting their you know their thoughts out there with this social media either our species makes it or we don't <laughs> either we yeah. survive or we don't uh, that's where i'm at is right now i think we need to uh really look deeper at supply chains and distribution networks. And I'm very concerned about this big group of truckers that met up in California this week and what's going to happen with this movement in America, as far as the, uh, the movement that Canada is starting again here in America. So yeah. our whole system is very fragile, easily destabilized, difficult to stabilize, easy to destabilize. Yep. And I, I just heard of a system in Australia where a guy pays about five to ten dollars, and there's fifty artisanal shops that he can order food from, and for ten dollars he can get different like herbs from all these different places, some cheese, some meat, 
and it's it's a real uh, logistics problem that they solved in this little town in uh, in Australia. So I think on a micro level, you can get great logistics, and I think Uber was a good start to uh, for ride sharing. I think that kind of a model, I think, might be able to propagate yeah. for journalism, for legal, for health. We'll, we'll see. I mean, we have if you ever need to. You have urban yeah. mass transit, but then the, the sprawling suburbs kind of rendered urban mass transit uh, less functional than it needed to be. Yep. Well, it's I'm, I'm hoping that the T stop from where I live. Yeah, I think that the biggest thing that I'm concerned about in America is uh, the baby boomer generation getting older and needing actual good health care, not bullshit health care. And that's yeah. Kusela. Kusela said she sends her regards to the GCC. She's in LA donating free acupuncture, uh, basically free. It's like $15 for acupuncture visits at the clinic that she uh, is graduating from. Yeah. So I think that's important. Affordable health care, very important. And I do affordable appliance repair. We don't charge anything except the parts. <laughs> You're saving a lot of people. That's that's uh, adds up. I mean, one lady brought in with a 50 year old uh black and decker can opener that was just so worn down, and you can't get parts for it because they're manufacturers. I, and I said, I, I, There's nothing I can do, I can't get the I can't replace the part that's worn out because they don't make it anymore, and it's 50 years old. <laughs> could, could we 3D print her a can opener? Oh, I could give her, I have a can opener that I don't use, electric one. I could just give it, given it to her. But she yeah. had a what an under the counter space saver instead of a countertop, which was this one takes up, you know, half a square foot on your table. So on your countertop. Anyway, but yeah. you know, about half the time we we save an item and it gets an, another uh year or two of life out of it. Do do you guys have scrap parts or what do you do for uh, all the parts and pieces? Well, we, so routine parts that are sort of, you know, uh, you know, general hardware we have. Now, if you have to buy a, a, a custom part for an item, we go on to eBay. So if I need to replace a, a, a battery uh, a clock motor, those are kind of interchangeable. Belts for old turntables, you know, guy had a really nice Technics turntable in the belt failed after you know 20 years 12 dollars for a new belt off the eBay. nice brand new belt and the, the, the needle was fine everything else was fine which just he, he had it sitting in storage for a few years after they moved and the belt just kind of you know you know what rubber does it yep age, it disintegrates with age so, yeah most, i could have fixed were... it with a rubber band but I said, for free, I can give you a rubber band. It'll probably last a couple of years. Or for $12, you can get the original equipment belt. He says, $12. Then he gave us $25 and says, keep the change. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. He, he would have had to buy a whole new device just for that belt. Turns out. How to do it. And it was and replacing a belt on that's trivial. There's, there's no work involved. You don't even have to hardly take anything apart. Just lift, lift the turntable off put the belt on, drop it back down and just flip it over the cap stand and you're done. It was nice. Like, do it. I showed him how to do it. Not that he ever has to do it again. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting a lot of stake in the communities of the DIY and uh, there's a whole community of people that take apart all of the cell phones when they're built and get in there and they, you know, licensed to uh, have the tools and the ability to do that. I replaced the battery in this, uh, Motorola Droid. This is one where you actually have to pry off the back, with, which is glued on, and then use a whole bunch of micro Torx drivers. Yes. And, and But I got the replacement battery off of eBay for like, I don't know, 12 bucks or something. And then I had to buy the tiny Torx to go with it. But I put a new battery in this, and it's working fine. Nice. And the, the glue was hours. okay? You the had the tools, the tools to get the glue off of? The uh, I just I just took a like a like a credit card type of piece of plastic and just worked mm -hmm. my way around and got it off and then had to take off a bunch of screws. But um, I had watched I had watched like three or four YouTube videos 
on this particular model before I felt I understood exactly what I had to do and learned enough from the videos to pull it off. And, and I didn't screw it up. I didn't screw up the operation and put the new battery in and we're back in business. So my neighbor gave my neighbor retired this and gave it to me. He said, race my stuff. I said, okay. And you know, finally the battery died. So I've, pa I've paid less than $20 because I got the whole unit for free <laughs> for my neighbor. Yep, parts and labor, mostly labor. Yeah, well, but you know, what else I'm gonna do with my time? Oh, that's great. I, I'm excited to get back. I took a year off of web development, uh, you know, to have the kid and COVID and everything. And I'm getting back into it and I'm looking at the new technologies and it's almost like I was off for 20 years. Like the, the way that internet web development is going, everyone's trying to do this web three thing. And I just yeah. find it to be stupid. I just don't, I, I felt like it was working. All of the web development I was doing before worked great. I don't need to be on these NFT blockchain fintech. It's just stupid. I just don't see the point of it. I, I keep old technology going for 20, 30 years. You know, for, it does the job for what I need. Yep. Anyway, there's a story. Sun is out. <laughs> well, I'll let you get back to your day. Thank you for, uh, yeah, this was the most pleasant Ukraine conversation I've had since the war started. So thank you. <laughs> it's only been a day. <laughs> See how it goes. Be safe. All right. See you. Blessings. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Cheers. Okay, Sam, I'm going to end it for all. And for all.